would like to at this point welcome everybody to our second uh, annual WEX Awards Malaysia. So I just want to at this point say good morning to our distinguished guest, uh, Ms. Sarah Nibs, Regional Director at Interim of the UN Women Regional Office for Asia and Pacific. Mr. Timo Guzman, uh, Minister Councillor, Head of Political Affairs, Press and Information of the European Union Delegation to Malaysia. Ms. Karima El Khori, UN Resident Coordinator for Malaysia, Singapore, and Brunei Darussalam. Our esteemed judges, WEPS Awards applicants, and guests, welcome to our UN Women 2022 WEPS Awards Malaysia ceremony. Yay! Um, I am Lisa uh, from League Women, and today I'm very honored to be your host for this very prestigious uh, uh, award um, and recognizing uh, Malaysia-based organizations who are doing incredible work in this gender equality and women's empowerment space. Now, we have a very exciting two hours ahead of us today with a mix of keynote speeches, breakout room discussions, and of course, the highlight and the reason why we're all here today, the announcement of our 2022 Webs Awards Malaysian winners. Now, at this point, I would also like to add that winners of each category this year will be automatically pulled into our regional ceremony and more about that at, uh, towards the end um, of our day today. So thank you again, everybody who has taken their time and their morning to join us here on Zoom. We still have a few more people trickling in. And we will also be sharing this recording uh, at the end. So to those who are re-watching it in their own time, thank you so much again for making, uh, making some time to watch and, and really hear from these amazing companies and individuals that we will be highlighting. So a few housekeeping rules before we begin. Please, uh, to ensure that this sure. is a smooth uh, experience for everybody, please stay muted. Um, do not record uh, because it is, we will be recording on our end. Uh, we'd like for you to ensure that your Zoom display name is accurate. If you need any assistance, please uh, reach out to one of the lead women team and we will assist you. Otherwise, feel free to uh, rename yourself so that we know who, how can we identify you. We will be taking a group photo uh, towards the end after we've announced all our winners. Please be present and feel free to use the Zoom background a photo like myself here if you'd like to join in. Uh, it would be really nice when we do take that group photo if everybody have the same background. So it feels like we are in the same, you know, physical space in that sense since we are, cannot be there physically together, right? Um, so our colleague, my colleagues will be dropping in the uh, file for you to download so that you can use that background. And again, if you need any assistance, the Lead Women team is all here to support you. Okay, that's all for the housekeeping. Uh, for some of us who are fairly new uh, to what the WEX Awards is, please give me some time to maybe uh, give you a bit of context. So the UN Women Asia Pacific WEX Awards is the first regional awards initiative that recognizes companies and individuals who are taking action for gender equality in the region aligned to the women's empowerment principles. So that's what the WEX stands for. And this was initiated as part of the We Empower Asia program. It's also a program under the UN Women Initiative funded by and was in partnership with the Re European Union. And this year, we are happy to say that this initiative continues on with the support of the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So we're really happy that we are still able to run this on an annual basis as we continue to recognize more and more Malaysian-based companies. So as some of you might know, while the Asia Pacific Webs Awards is in its third year, this is actually the second year that we are running a national ceremony. And like we mentioned, it's uh, every year when we get the applications, it just blows us away to see how, in, how many you know, Malaysian-based organizations deserve this recognition. And we hope to continue doing this in the years to come. And we will celebrate awardees today in four main categories, as you can see here on the screen. So we will be celebrating the leadership commitment category, 
gender inclusive workplace, transparency and reporting, and community engagement and partnerships. And this year as well, we will continue, um, we have continued on with this special awards for small, medium enterprises or SMEs. So we're very happy to be acknowledging and celebrating three SME champions this year. So as part of this whole um, event, and we want to make sure everyone's engaged and you also have fun, my goal here is to make sure that uh, we keep everybody entertained and uh, keep to time. But on your side, if you would like to, we will be, um, if you would like to share this event on social media, we will have a few hashtags that you can use. My colleague will also drop that in the chat box. Uh, so you can use hashtag what's awards, hashtag generation equality, or hashtag what's awards MY 2022. And that would help us raise awareness of this ceremony on all the social media platforms. So let's move on to the first item on our agenda, shall we? All right, to officially kick us off and set the scene for the event today, we actually have a special video sent in from Ms. Sarah Nibs, who is the Regional Director at Interim of the UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Uh, so I will now let our team play the video for you. Excellencies, representatives from government, business and the wider development community. I want to take this chance to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this third edition of the Asia Pacific WEPS Awards and the second national ceremony for the WEPS Awards in Malaysia. I'm so sorry I can't be there with you in person today, but it's exciting to see that the WEPS Awards ceremony this year comes as a culminating event to what I know has been an illuminating and collaborative past two days at the first Equality at Work convention. Since 2019, UN Women has been working to increase the number of women participating in and leading businesses in the Asia Pacific region through We Empower Asia, a program funded by and in partnership with the European Union. This program has taken an ecosystem approach to advance gender inclusive business by engaging policymakers, regulators and businesses of all sizes and sectors. Our work is guided by the Women's Empowerment Principles or WEPs the only holistic framework for businesses to promote gender equality across their value chain, from the workplace to the marketplace and into the communities where they operate. In Malaysia, we have seen tremendous uptake in business action for gender equality in the past two and a half years. This increased commitment and action is evidenced in part by the fact that in 2019, there were just six signatories from Malaysia and today we have nearly 100. I'm also very excited that more than 300 companies have attended WEPS awareness sessions and 60 underwent deeper implementation trainings through our WEPS Activator Malaysia campaign, running collaboration with Lead Women. The WEPS Activator and WEPS assessment tools have supported companies with a range of gender equality efforts. These efforts range from building the pipeline for women leaders, supporting parents with caregiving responsibilities, to creating a work environment free of all forms of harassment and taking steps to procure for more women-owned businesses. UN Women is extremely proud to have had Lead Women as our key implementing partner for this work in Malaysia over the past three years. It is their diligent efforts on the ground that have helped us to achieve increased commitments and tangible actions towards implementing the WEPs and identify some of the outstanding initiatives that will be celebrated today. Although We Empower Asia officially ended in August of this year, we were excited to announce in May a new two-year partnership with Lead Women. This partnership will help us deepen and advance work begun under We Empower Asia to increase the implementation of the WEPs. As we embark on this new partnership, I do want to recognize that none of this could have been achieved without the support and partnership of the European Union. It is with their continued support and appetite for innovation that we have achieved tremendous results and laid the foundation for catalyzed action as we move forward. On this occasion, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the Government of Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, DFAT, for their ongoing support to the WEPS Awards and especially this 2022 edition. We are here today to recognize exemplary private sector action for gender equality. But I also want to take this chance to highlight the importance of an ecosystem approach wherein all key actors, policymakers, regulators, business and civil society collaborate to advance gender responsive business conduct. For instance, the 1921 government mandate 
that publicly traded firms must have at least one woman on their board by September of this year. This is a critical step on the pathway to ensure more women achieve leadership positions and influence decision making. It is only when all actors work together that we create system-wide change. I'm so pleased that today we will be showcasing the initiatives of 12 businesses that are leading this change by demonstrating innovation, multi-stakeholder partnerships and long-term investments to foster gender equality. For the company's CEOs and entrepreneurs whose actions are recognised tonight and to all those who applied for the awards, I thank you. Your efforts not only inspire others, but also send a strong signal that businesses of all sizes and sectors are responsible for and have a pivotal role to play in transforming workplaces, marketplaces and communities to become more equitable and gender inclusive. Once again, my congratulations to all the awardees today and we look forward to working with you and others to build our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the recap on how the Wax Activator campaign has uh, started and evolved and continued here in Malaysia. And likewise, on behalf of Lead Women, we're so honored to be given this opportunity to continue uh, the work of the Wax here in Malaysia through our continued partnership with UN Women. Um, so it has certainly been an exciting journey. And I know uh, Sarah mentioned that we are almost at 100 signatories. Uh, last I checked, we were at 94. So for those of you who are joining us and you realize that your organization is not yet a signatory, we welcome you to reach out to us and we'll give you, it's a very quick and uh, simple process. It's an online pledge, zero financial commitment uh, and zero obligation to do any reporting whatsoever. It's really more of get collecting all the voices together to say Malaysia's private sector is serious in gender equality. So if you'd like to learn how your organization can become a signatory, reach out to us. And we'd like to see the number reach 100, if not more, by the end of the year. And like Sarah mentioned, this whole web uh, activator campaign, the awareness and implementation sessions that we've done in the last year or so, is due to large in part because it's only uh, possible due to the support, the continued support and partnership of the European Union. And so to deliver his opening remarks for us, we would like to share with everybody here a congratulatory video from a very distinguished guest, Mr. Timo Guzman, who is the Minister, Councillor, Head of Political Affairs, Press and Information of the European Union Delegation to Malaysia to say a few words. So over to the team to share the video. Very good morning to all of you. Ms. Sarah Nips, Regional Director at Interim of the UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Ms. Karima al Khori, President Coordinator of the United Nations in Malaysia. And Abraham and the Lead Women Team, Distinguished Guests and Friends. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. I am really pleased to be here for the second national celebration of the UN Women WE Peace Awards in Malaysia. Last year, 15 companies were awarded for their outstanding efforts to support women's empowerment, and I look forward to learning more about those who will be recognized today. In the Asia Pacific and across the world, the European Union is a committed supporter of gender equality and works to ensure that girls and women everywhere have the opportunities, policies, and infrastructure in place to succeed and, thr and thrive, especially to become equal partners in the economy. Although the world is beginning to recover from the pandemic and shift to a new normal, action for women's economic empowerment is needed now more than ever, as hard-won gains for gender equality are at risk of being reversed. The latest report on progress towards the SDGs estimates that at the current rate, it will take up to 286 years to close gaps in legal protection and remove discriminatory laws, 140 years for women to be represented equally in positions of power and leadership in the workplace, and at least 40 years to achieve equal representation in national parliaments. Put simply, progress will be stalled and our societies and economies will suffer unless we all collaborate to take action and develop policies that support gender equality 
and women's full and equal economic participation. In this effort, the private sector has a key role in influencing and accelerating inclusive and sustainable development. This is why we are proud to partner with UN Women on the We Empower Asia program, which ran from 2019 to August of this year, a few weeks ago, and worked to increase the number of women participating and leading in business in seven countries in the Asia Pacific. In Malaysia, we, we Empower Asia partner with Lead Women on the WEP's Activator campaign, which raised awareness among more than 300 companies of how the Women's Empowerment Principles, or WEPs, could guide them to become more gender responsive across their value chains. Women at all levels, in all forms of work, can only achieve equal economic participation and career progression with inclusive, safe, and supportive workplaces. The WEPs provide businesses with a framework for action that spans from supporting women to achieve leadership positions in the corporate boardroom and the C-suit down to supplier factory floors and farms to ensure women work in an environment free from all forms of harassment. In Malaysia, the European Union also supports the UN Women Safe and Fair program, which works to ensure the rights, opportunities and safety of women migrant workers in the ASEAN region. We were very happy to see Safe and Fair collaborate with We Empower Asia to use the WEP's framework to develop an innovative capacity building initiative ending sexual harassment in the world of work. The initiative works with corporate leaders, procurement teams, and suppliers alike to provide trainings, a self-assessment, and a roadmap to holistically identify, address, and mitigate sexual harassment in the workplace and across the broader supply chain, with a focus on women migrant workers. The program was piloted last year with the support of Lead Women and with the recent passing of the sexual harassment bill, we look forward to seeing more companies ready to deepen their WEP's journey and sign on to take the trainings. Although the We Empower Asia program has come to an end, the work is only getting started. I am so pleased to see that United Nations Women and Lead Women have entered a new partnership to carry forward engagement and capacity building for the private sector in Malaysia through the WEPs. I want to encourage all companies present who are not yet signatories to sign the WEPs. Visit the website today and learn how the WEPs can support your organization to become more gender responsive, no matter your size or sector. We urge businesses to embody the ambitious vision of the WEPs and engender a culture of gender equality that cascades to all levels of the organization and extends to its customers, suppliers, and partners alike. That is what many of the awardees you will hear from today are doing. And that is exactly why initiatives like the WEP's award serve as a powerful platform to convene diverse stakeholders and inspire others to action. The European Union is proud to have initiated the WEP's awards under the We Empower Asia program. And we are equally proud that the awards continues on through other partners such as Lead Women and the Australian government. With that, I look forward to learning more about the initiatives recognized today. And I want to extend my congratulations to all the leaders, companies and SMEs that are being awarded. Thank you all for your kind attention and all the best for this inspiring event. Thank you so much, Mr. Timo, for sending across that uh, video filled with very encouraging, uh, encouraging and well wishes to everybody here. And um, it's really great to see uh, a big organization like the European Union continue to support 
the the cause for women's economic empowerment not just in organizations but wider right or beyond and for those of us who've been part of the equality at work convention in the past two days you would see that the wax is designed to be a holistic framework so not just looking at leadership and workplace but actually looking at your gender responsive marketing procurement and also uh, organizations impact to your wider community so we are really grateful for the eu support in ensuring that we move the needle in this space and next up, we also have some well wishes from our UN resident coordinator for Malaysia, Singapore and Brunei Darussalam, Ms. Karima El Khori for our guest here today. So I will push, uh, I will sort of now pass it over again to our team to play the video from Ms. Karima. Good morning. It's an immense pleasure to be here today. On behalf of the United Nations in Malaysia, I wish to welcome everyone to the national ceremony for the UN Women 2022 Malaysia WEPS Awards. This event comes as the culmination of the Equality at Work Convention, an intense and fruitful two days dedicated to exploring the role of the private sector in contributing to gender equality and women's economic empowerment. As emphasized in the remarks of Ms. Sarah Nips and Mr. Timo Guzman, Promoting women's equitable economic participation is vital to ensuring both social and economic progress. Gender equality is at the core of the 2030 Agenda. It cuts across all 17 sustainable development goals and progress towards the global goals is very much dependent on action to advance gender equality and empower women. As we begin to recover from COVID-19, we must note that progress on gender parity is not recovering. Globally, it is estimated that 47 million women and girls have been pushed into extreme poverty since the pandemic began. Women's already disproportionate share of care and domestic work has increased with school and care center closures. The ILO estimates that 2 million working mothers left the workforce in 2020 alone. Prior to the pandemic, it was estimated that the global gender gap would take 99 years to close. That figure now stands at 132 years. The data from Malaysia reflects a similar worrying trend. While Malaysia's score have improved slightly in the last global gender gap report, the country still ranks 103 out of 146 countries ahead of only two other ASEAN countries. In terms of economic participation and opportunity, Malaysia ranks 88 out of 146 countries among the lowest ASEAN member states. Malaysia's female labor participation rate remains one of ASEAN's lowest at 55.5% compared to an 80% participation rate for their male counterparts. Research conducted in 2019 shows women in Malaysia spent a daily average of 3.6 hours in domestic work compared to men's 2.2 hours. This rate certainly increased during the pandemic and has a direct impact on women's economic participation. In the most recent Malaysia Labour Force survey, 42% of the 7.27 million women in the labour force cited housework and family responsibilities as their reason for not being able to work and earn an income. I remember highlighting some of these facts last year, but they bear repeating as an urgent call to action. We all must step up our effort and quicken the pace of progress. Last week, UN Women released a gender snapshot of women's leadership in ASEAN. While the report found that women make up 41% of managers, this represents a mere 2% increase over the past 20 years. Malaysia boasts the highest rate of women on board in the region, but has yet to break the 30% minimum that was set for 2020. Public policies are instrumental to catalyze systemic change. As we have heard earlier, the government requirement for large firms to have at least one woman on their board is a positive legislative step. However, the push 
from policymakers also needs to be met by a pull from the private sector to lead the way and influence others to action. The private sector has the ability and also the responsibility to play a pivotal role in driving women's equal opportunity and equal participation and accelerate inclusive economic growth. I take today's opportunity to call on more companies to amplify this pull factor and commit to diversity and inclusion efforts that create opportunities for women at all levels. In the women's empowerment principles, companies of all sizes and sectors can find a framework to assess where they stand and create a practical action plan to become more gender inclusive in the boardroom, in office spaces, among suppliers, and in the communities where they operate. Malaysia continues to be the leader among all other Asia Pacific countries with the most companies completing the web's gender gap analysis tool, more than 200 of them, and there are nearly 100 companies that have signed on to become web's signatories. Although the We Empower Asia program has ended, we are grateful to the European Union for their dedication to this program and for initiating the web's awards. As the United Nations in Malaysia, we renew our firm commitment to continue our collaboration with UN Women, LEAD Women, and all key stakeholders. We will work together to advance public and private sector policies and practices in line with the women's empowerment principles. We remain fully engaged to help Malaysia build a more gender equal and resilient future. I know that everyone is eager to get to the awards portion of today's event, so let me end by congratulating all the companies and leaders who are being recognized today. I also commend all other organizations that applied or are working behind the scenes to make gender inclusive business a reality in Malaysia and everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Karima, for sharing uh, the statistics once again to remind us that there is still a lot of work to do, uh, but also for the encouraging words uh, to say that, you know, we are still, we are making progress, uh, but there is still a lot of need to collectively work together. And I know, you know yesterday, at least as part of our convention, we emphasized the need to have a collective of organizations, uh, corporate community actually, to really move this conversation into sustainable action and really make changes in, this, 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 in the statistics uh, and where our standings are with regards to women's economic uh, empowerment and also involvement. So thank you so much again to all our three speakers today, Ms. Sarah, Mr. Timo and Ms. Karima for sending in your videos. Yes, they cannot join us here, but hopefully in the next round, we'll be able to have them join us live. All right, we are finally at the most exciting and perhaps most nerve-wracking part of the day, the announcement of our WAX Award winners. But before that, I would like to use this time to acknowledge an amazing group of individuals who were tasked with an incredibly difficult job, which is to identify uh, and review and score our applications. So we have an esteemed panel of experts today this year who join us as judges. So at this point, I'd like to thank Ms. Anima Kosai, founder of the Speak Up Collective, Betty Yo, founding member of All Women's Action Society or AWAM, Badri Abdullah, founder of the Tulips Movement, Ms. Chong Chai Nyo, an independent director from Bursa, Malaysia, Dr. Shanti Tambia, Associate Professor of Gender Studies, University of Malaya, Professor Dr. Noraida Endud, Professor at Unit for Research on Women and Gender, or Kanita, School of Social Sciences at the University Science Malaysia, Ms. Shamila Ravindran, Board Advisor of Lean In Malaysia, and last but certainly not least, Dr. Wong La Yong, Board Member of Penang Women's Development Corporation. We are very honored uh, to have these expert individuals with their vast collective experience in this space. And we will be hearing more uh, from, from them on their reflections as they have reviewed the applications for this year. So let's get to the good part. So the first 
category we will be announcing the winners of is the gender inclusive workplace category. Now this award recognizes companies who have adopted relevant gender inclusive measures in the workplace, such as addressing unequal care burden, accelerating progress towards equal pay and promoting women's careers and leadership. So to share her reflections and also present the award for this category, I would like to welcome to the virtual stage, uh, Betty Yo, consultant at Engender Consultancy and one of the founding members of AWAM. So if everybody can just give a virtual, uh, virtual applause, I would like to welcome to the stage, Betty. Thank you, Lisa. Firstly, thank you all for giving me this opportunity to be a judge in this category of gender inclusive workplace. Being a judge has really opened my eyes to the work of corporations and organizations, including small and medium sized uh, organizations in the advocacy of gender equality, starting with gender inclusive workplaces. A big thank you to you all who have joined in this advocacy to forward the gender equality cause. The application in this category was all with practical projects in supporting women towards this goal. I had good vibes as I read the projects. What stood out overall to me was not only the companies or organizations making their workplaces more gender inclusive, it was even one organization that took it further by engaging in legislative advocacy. And these are all very encouraging work in progress for gender empowerment, women's empowerment. As an activist on women and gender issues for a long time, I understand how challenging it takes to make change in society. The sexual harassment bill itself took 20 years. So you can imagine how long we have been in this work. As a first time judge, the progress I hope to see in the applications is that these projects develop beyond workplaces. When we talk about gender equality, it almost always focuses on women and rightly so it should. However, it must always be in tandem with working with men. And at the end of the day, the community or society will also benefit from practicing gender equality. It takes time working to increase the knowledge and to work from knowing gender to gender inclusive uh, at the workplace is not easy. So a wonderful thank you to all the organizations participating in this. For all applicants, I applaud the wonderful efforts it would be, and it has been, to see the projects going into uh, progress, but it would be more wonderful to see the outcome of these projects or programs. As an activist, I do also carry out projects, and they are funded projects, and the funders will always ask, what is the outcome? What has changed? So it would be great that these are the elements that you put into your projects. So when I score, I look into this factor. I look for the outcome of the projects and what are the supporting evidence. It is great whenever you read the project starting, a lot of data supporting evidence for the need of the project. But at the end of the project, it's lacking the evidence to show the change. And this is where I would take pleasure now to award and to announce the awardees for the 2022 WEBS Award Gender Inclusive Workplace category. Second runner up, KPMG. First runner up, Accenture. Winner. Gamuda Berhat. Congratulations to all. I would now like to invite Wong Lai Ling, Senior Manager, 
Keshar and admin of Kamuda to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much to the UN, WEP and judges. Uh, warmest greetings um, to all, um, to our respected members of the UN Women Asia Pacific WEP's organization, our esteemed judges and juries of the awards, fellow winners, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Kamuda, I am extremely honored to receive the 2022 UN Women Asia Pacific WEP Awards under the Gender Inclusive Workplace category. We are very grateful for the recognition we have received for our work. By being here today, we are focusing on turning the gender neutrality conversation into actions, the need to take bold action for change, and a balanced leadership in the new digital era. But the question is why? Why is women empowerment so necessary both in business and in the wider society? We at Gamuda believe women are one of the most powerful investments we can make in building a better future. At Gamuda, gender inclusion advocacy is the work in the workplace has been a journey we've embarked on for decades. The nature of the company falls under the traditionally male-dominated engineering industry. Nevertheless, we are dedicated to ensuring women are able to balance personal goals and family care, as well as pursue their career aspirations. These investments come in the form of developing several initiatives, benefits packages and facilitate facilities to better suit the needs of our female workforce, be it single mothers or working mothers. Our success factors, um, first and foremost, we must go beyond lip service to action and ensure the right policies and procedures are in place to govern the operations in multiple areas, from office culture to career advancement and pay. Policies such as the Code of Business Ethics, diversity, inclusion, human rights, family care, flexible work arrangements are very important to attract and retain the best workforce. Including these policies help to create a climate that is conducive to gender neutrality. It also ensures all employees are recognized for their merits, abilities and strengths rather than gender. We also strongly believe that we must have programs that target and benefit women as a solid support system means we are able to accrue and understand from the women themselves what the needs are and what tools they need to help them professionally. Aligned with this, in 2018, we launched the Gamuda Women Empowerment Network, Ogben for short, to advance women's careers by providing an internal support network and mentorship opportunities. Gamuda also created a women-centric benefits package under the Women at Work initiative to ease the challenges and domestic responsibilities of working mothers. As a testament of our commitment towards gender neutrality, 43% of our board of directors consists of women, surpassing the 30% minimum benchmark. Gender diversity is reflected across the group's management levels and continues to have increased over the years too. Female employees have been steadily increasing up to 4% at senior management and middle management levels. This serves as an inspiration for women that there is no glass ceiling in the construction industry. From an education perspective, Gamuda runs a scholarship initiative targeting more women in STEM subjects to close the gender gap in the industry. Ladies and gentlemen, in all that we do, we hope to create equal opportunities. Today, by sharing our progress, we hold ourselves accountable and acknowledge that there is still a lot of room to improve. But let us assure you that this is not just a topic for today. We are committed to gender neutrality every single day. Thank you all very much. 
Thank you so much, Liling, and congratulations to our awardees, uh, KPMG Ascension, obviously the winner, Gamuda, for the incredible work. Now, to all our attendees today, we will have a breakout session later where you can ask all our runner-ups and our winners more questions and get to know a little bit more how they've implemented all these amazing initiatives. So you can also uh, learn from them and hopefully get some advice from them as well. A little bit more on uh, the breakout sessions later on. So thank you again, Betty, for sharing your reflections on this category as well. Now we move on to the community engagement and partnerships category. This category recognizes corporates who promote gender equality by working with community partners, such as NGOs or other organizations committed to advancing gender equality within their wider communities. It also seeks to award companies who are working towards systemic change through partnerships in any advocacy or multi-stakeholder platform to share their reflections and present the award for the community engagement and partnerships category let's give a round of virtual applause to professor dr noraida ended professor at unit for research on women and gender kanita school of social sciences university science malaysia and Badri Abdullah, founder of Tulips Movement and director of partnership, Unitar International University, to our virtual stage. Uh, thank you, uh, Lisa, uh, for the uh, invitation to be a judge, especially uh, women. That one. Um, some of the reflections, um, basically, judging. Uh, I thought the 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 uh, the the uh, competition was very intense uh, amongst the uh, uh, and basically what I can say from the just give me a minute please yeah. we, actually the competition was very intense uh, with very strong submissions uh, uh, in the process of judging uh, to learn a lot. Uh, was very inspiring how organizations uh, are working with communities to promote uh, gender equality in the course, the workplace, as well as uh, the marketplace and community. So, in my humble opinion, very reassuring to observe the uh, significant uh, progress by the organizations in, <coughs> in advancing uh, women economic empowerment through advocacy and impactful initiatives. But I would like to suggest that um, this, this impactful initiative needs to be there some form of measurements. Lah. Because throughout the submissions, I really could not see the impact made in terms of numbers. You know, if there is data support, it would have been much better. And as well as um, what another observation is that it's just some of them are just sending out their policies. So policies are good, but we really cannot measure because they have not shown any uh, numbers, right? Uh, therefore, in future, uh, probably a uh, lead woman at the union would like to take this under consideration and also align some of their initiatives directly with a particular web. I think that would be very uh, helpful. So over to you, uh, Prof. Thank you, um, Mr. Badri. Again, I think um, I would like to uh, thank the organizers, uh, uh, web organizers and, uh, and collaborators for inviting me and appointing me as uh, one of the judges for this award this year. Um, uh, I I wouldn't want to uh, go on with the, the way that the, the, ju the judging has been done. I think I have some notes given to the organizers about uh, how, how things can, can improve, but I would like to focus on the positive outcomes of uh, this whole um, exercise. Um, what stood out to me about the applications in the category for community engagement actually is the wide ranging issues that have been tackled by the applicant organizations. Uh, I think the companies have engaged with both the internal community, so-called, the, 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 the people inside the organization themselves, 
um, so the, their own staff and employees, and also with the wider community of people in different categories, mothers, children, people living in poverty, women affected by uh, gender-based violence, and particularly also with uh, uh, with government stakeholders uh, to, to improve many of these situations. Um, uh, the company's efforts actually demonstrate you know, how uh, work towards gender equality has increasingly been understood and internalized. Although this, of course, uh, uh, desirably can be improved. Um, so, so I think there, there is an effort towards, uh, towards internalizing um, uh, the, con the concept and the advocacy for gender equality uh, and women's empowerment um, uh, because it, the, the efforts become part of the structure. So uh, we are we are actually tackling the the structural issue. You know, if you if you have um, had a chance to to look into the work of uh, Aruna Rao and and her colleagues uh, in in gender at work. Uh, so so they 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 come up with a with a four quadrant of creating change. And one of the quadrants uh, uh, one of the quadrants is actually um, uh, basically intervening in. Uh, what we call deep structure uh, of uh, any kind of um, uh, organization where the structure is against uh, gender equality or perpetual or, uh, or the structure is historically uh, very patriarchal you know so so there is a there is an evidence in in in, in um, all of the African uh, organization that uh, uh, the deep structure is being slowly dismantled by internalizing uh, the idea uh, about gender equality, um, and and also uh, this has led to implementing programs that can achieve the goal of gender equality and women's empowerment, uh, as required, particularly by the Sustainable Development Goal uh, number five, uh, goal number goal number eight on decent work, and also goal number ten on reducing in, uh, inequality. And this has been done, uh, especially through targeting multiple communities. And I think this, are, uh, this is very commendable. Um, I would like to commend and encourage the companies to continue their good work. Uh, but at the same time, as uh, Mr. Badri also has mentioned, you know, some improvement can be, uh, can be um, uh, also introduced, you know, uh, for example, to take time to take a little bit more time to review how the programs could continue to be sustained and improved over time. Uh, there are programs that tend to be a kind of one-off. Um, um, uh, the out uh, proper collection of data, um, you know, for the company, especially uh, sexually segregated data. Um, and of course, uh, ultimately, I look forward to more widespread and to real buy-in by the private sector stakeholders uh, towards achieving gender equality and empowerment of women and girls, as well as attaining, as I said, decent work and reducing inequalities in general. Um, much of the work and programs showcased in relation to this uh, WEBS award actually resonate with my own work and advocacy over the years. So I am really, I was really excited, and I'm continuing to be excited to 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 engage uh, and network with uh, the various industries here uh, and and other stakeholders involved in this award uh, this year and beyond. So thank you so much again for uh, inviting me to be the judge, and I uh, wish uh, all everyone um, you know uh, more success in the future. Thank you. Um, I think now uh, we will announce uh, the awardees for the 2020 Malaysia Webs Awards, Community Engagement and Partnership category. So I will announce first the, the, the first runner up. Uh, it's Kimberly Club Malaysia. And uh, Badri will announce the winner. Yeah. So, uh, and the winner of this uh, category of Community Engagement and Partnership uh, is Aksiata Group Terhad. Congratulations to everyone. We would now like to invite uh, Norlida Asmi, Group Chief People Officer at Akiata, to say a few words. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Encik Badri and uh, Professor. It's truly an honor. And on behalf of Akiata, we are so delighted 
that the category that we've been um, highlighted to win is actually the community and partnerships. It's very interesting. My first thank you would actually be to the UN, WEP, because when they exposed us to the criticality and the holistic vision of it, it really shook up the organizations that I have been in. When you talk about DEI, it means a lot more than just an event. How do you embed it into the way that we do? So I'm very proud that um, over the last two years, we've really taken it deeper where it's now become part of our business and a value chain. Uh, we look across our value chain of stakeholders all the way from the boards uh, to our partners. Our customers remain very important, but of course um, our own people, right? So it is in our EVP. And ultimately our view was, how do we make it impactful? How do we make it such that we can repeat it? In 2021, when we established Women of Axiata and Male Allies, we wanted to call it upfront that we wanted the partnership of the women to drive this inclusivity agenda because it's going to go beyond gender. It's going to come with a lot of intersectionalities under just even gender. So we said, okay, um, maybe I'm greedy. I want it to be big. I want it to be faster because as the speaker spoke earlier, there's so much more to do and we really need to go faster. So one of the things that we do is we have a people a working circle across Axiata Group, hoping that we can implement and influence them to do in the frontier in emerging economies in Asia uh, so that they have diversity advocates, both men and women, that was so critical to me and that we actually fold in into our people who are driving ESG. Because if I want to impact communities, it has to be a much more coordinated story. So that's why we're very proud with WAMA. The other thing, a strategy that Axiata took is, how can we collaborate with the various advocacy groups that's been driving it? So apart from working with lead women, uh, we work with 30% because I'm a strong advocate that at the board, I need to be noisy and tell them, I want somebody there who's setting strategy to say, whenever there is a vacancy, I'm not asking you to appoint a woman, I'm asking you to give us equal opportunity and access and may the best person be appointed. I, I think that still happens. Uh, we also work with TM Forum because in the industry of telecommunication, it also tends to be uh, dominated by, by men. Uh, you have more women in the support and enabling organizations. My ex-boss told me I want the next group chief technology officer to be a woman. And I said to him, well, I need to build a pool. So therefore, it's very key. Recently, we also partnered with Lead Women and UNITA. We set out a plan, uh, uh, initiative called SHE, which stands for Sustainable, Human and Equitable. Our vision was that can we join our voices and don't look disparate as we bring inclusive and gender responsive programs to the organization. I'm especially proud of the program that we put here, if you would just allow me. We, because we are in the digital and telecommunication industry, we wanted to leverage on our strength in impacting the communities and the structural changes. So we partnered um, for the International Girls in ICT occasion, we partnered with KCOM. And as we go digital, the theme was access and safety. And this was launched by the International Telecommunication Union. So you're impacting even at a global level on how do we go up to there. And the curation of the program, we're very happy to say, was also done by Axeta Foundation, which has under its education pillar, it says, how do we go in, in promoting gender equality in young female students through the application of digital skills and technology to develop digital talent for the, for the country and minimize this digital divide. So that's what we wanted to do to apply to um, aspiring Malaysian youth. And this time we focus on the women and we measured. You know, I work in a company that data is king. So if I don't have data, they're not gonna listen to me. So our intention was to bring a benefit to a minimum in the first year of about up to 3000 high school uh, students and undergraduates. And in that first program, we impacted and touched the lives of about 2,686 2, um, number of girls. Recently, the Axiata Development Leadership Program, which is what this digital divide for, touched 85 female undergraduates from public and private universities and 2,600 female educations. We went via a live stream and you saw students leaning over tables wanting to listen. So I think for us, uh, impacting the community was important. Uh, my aspiration 
is that our organizations in our group will replicate this in the countries and leverage on our strength. Uh, with that, I wanted to share that, you know, if, as we build digital talents for the country, happy to share the program. And thank you very much to uh, Lead Women, UN, their esteemed judges, and of course, congratulations to the winners here. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you so much, Ali uh, Baji, and also Professor Noraida. Congratulations to Kimberly Clark and Axiata. And to learn more, especially to hear also the incredible work that Kimberly Clark has done, please stay towards the end to join that breakout room session. Okay, let's move on then to one of the most challenging, difficult, but yet important categories. For those who you've listened in uh, from the previous judges reflection, Measurement, getting the data like uh, Ollie mentioned, is very, very important. And that's why we have this category called transparency and reporting. And this is really awarding and recognizing companies who have been able to track or are currently tracking their performance and statistics uh, of their initiatives that work towards gender equality. And they have gone above and beyond to analyze, measure, and report as well on these policies themselves. So to share her reflection, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Chong Chai Myo, Independent Director of Bursa Malaysia, to share her reflections and also present the award for this category. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you, UNWEP team and lead woman for the opportunity to be part of the judging team this year. I'm pleased to represent Bursa Malaysia for the third year since the launch of the Malaysia WEP Awards a quick reflection from, from me from this category, uh, a quick reflection from me. First of all, I was impressed by the progress and quality of submissions in general. But what stood out for me for this category were number one, uh, was I was happy to see that the baseline data was clearly established, uh, the granularity and depth of data to ensure specific, specific areas were given the required focus and the deliberate effort to integrate diversity reports to HR people reports so that the actions can be taken holistically as a people's strategy rather than diversity as a standalone focus. I was also encouraged to see that automation and digital tools were being employed to support efficiency and accuracy reporting. Moving forward, I would recommend that companies continue to build on the repository of data to leverage on big data, machine learning and AI to progress to analyzing unstructured data so that behavioral and sentiment analysis can be done to give even greater depth of understanding on diversity challenges. I will now announce the only awardee, as, um, as, as mentioned by Lisa, it is a difficult category, it takes a long time, so it is a journey. So the awardee for the 2022 Malaysia Web Awards for Transparency and Reporting category goes to Maxis Malaysia. Congratulations, Maxis. I would like now to invite Natalia Navin, CHRO or Maxis, to say a few words. Thank you, Ms. Chong Chai Niu, for the kind words. Um, it is my honor and privilege to accept this award on behalf of our CEO, Gokhan Ogut, and the entire Maxis family. Firstly, thank you to UN Women and Lead Women for hosting the UN Women Asia Pacific WEP's awards and members of the selection committee for this recognition. At Maxis, we are proud of our commitment to provide an inclusive, diverse and collaborative environment for our employees. So they are empowered to create a positive impact, not just for themselves, but also for others. We pride ourselves on the Maxis way, our company's culture and values. And in building this, this philosophy, we focus on inclusion and diversity as one of the key drivers and enablers of human capital. In July 2021, we officially became a signatory of the Women Empowerment Principles established by the UN. And we are committed towards gender equality as well as upholding labor rights and human rights standards within the company. As part of this commitment, we work collaboratively with our stakeholders to foster business practices that empower women and encourage equal opportunities at the workplace. While we maintain a healthy female population within Maxis at 44%, 
we are also driving greater changes towards an inclusive and equitable workforce. To achieve our inclusive and diversity object, inclusion and diversity objectives, we began tracking employee data for progress monitoring and improvements. We strongly believe that good decisions are made based on data and only with good decisions, we can make an impact and achieve our objectives. So with that in mind, an online dashboard was developed internally to make real-time data accessible for key stakeholders within the company for quick, effective, and meaningful decision-making. Using the available on-time data, we began analyzing the employee data by gender to identify opportunities and gaps in relation to career development and inclusion among the women at Maxis as we want to develop a targeted and focused approach to achieve our objectives. This award is a testament to our commitment in ensuring that inclusion and diversity are incorporated into our human capital strategy. It is also a testament to the de dedication and collaborative spirit of our colleagues who are driven by our Maxis Way culture and a shared passion to always be ahead. I would like to thank Max's leadership team for their belief and support in this initiative, our people and organization team for their commitment and dedication in making this happen, and very importantly to our employees in Maxis for continuing to inspire each other to advance gender equality and women's economic empowerment. Again, thank you very much for this award and congratulations to all winners. Thank you so much, Natalia, and congratulations again to Maxis, and thank you, Chanyo, for sharing with us your reflections. Now, next up, we will be announcing the winners for the special category, the SME Champions. Now, this category, we want to show that regardless of your organization size, you can make a difference with the limited resources that you might have and receive recognition for all your efforts. You and women decided to create a special award because we understand SMEs might not have the internal resources to build holistic gender equality policies or put practices in place to compete with the larger or more established companies. But we want to give them that recognition for still, despite all odds, lead impactful initiatives that continue to empower women and their economic uh, involvement in their organization. The applications this year, I could say, are truly, truly inspiring. And to present the SME Champions Award and to share her reflections, we have a special video from Anima Kosai, because she's currently based in the UK, uh, to share uh, her reflection. Uh, over to the, the, to the team to show her video. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning. I am delighted to be back judging some incredible entries. It's great to see more women at senior levels. And this is where a few Malaysian entries rocked. Malaysian branches of multinationals were outperforming their global company's gender inclusion targets. So what can the rest of the world learn from Malaysian women? That's an inquiry I want to leave you with. Malaysian women should and must be on the global stage, leading conversations about leadership and global issues. As ambassador for the Center of Global Inclusion and the work I have done in the diversity, equity, inclusion space, I look at women empowerment with an intersectional lens. This means recognizing that women are not a monolith. As you focus on women, you will see different perspectives and needs of women from different races, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different parts of the country, including East Malaysia, women with disabilities, visible and invisible, which in have increased with COVID, women who are lesbian and bisexual, trans women. The typical Ma Malaysian workplace today does not work for Malaysian women or even men. Now, some of the larger companies, uh, the entrants were dancing around this, but it's really the SME entries who were truly challenging the status quo with some really innovative pushback. Now, the working world was designed during the Western Industrial Revolution and is focused on output and uniformity. For example, a woman engineer has to work in protective clothing designed by and for average sized white men using equipment designed by and for average sized white men. 
in an environment designed by Western white Victorian factory owners for workers during the Industrial Revolution 150 years ago. On top of that, Malaysian women work in a patriarchal society, juggling family and household. Our nine to five working in offices far away from their home just does not work for Malaysian women. This needs a change. The thing about SMEs, they're lean enough to really understand workers' needs. And this is what the SME entrants did. They ask, what's not working? How can I make it better? Wendy Kaur of Pentago Landscape saw the dire shortage of women in landscape architecture and architecture. And think about this. If there were not enough women architects and designers, how would our buildings and public spaces work for half the population and their needs? See, you see the vicious cycle? So Wendy and Pentago focus to equip and support budding female landscape architects to prosper in a gender biased industry in a deeply collaborative and networked way. Another entrant, Studio DL, a photography agency, started the utilization of all female camera crews to challenge the stereotype of women can't lift heavy things. So they'd identified a big problem that deters women from joining the industry. And in fact, the industry just doesn't hire women for this reason. Equipment is heavy and bulky. It's the same for film crews. In fact, so many trades where equipment just does not suit the smaller size women. So why are we expecting photographers, filmmakers, contractors to literally shoulder the burden when designers and manufacturers can change this? So those industries where you see sexual harassment, not enough women, et cetera, it's not just the mindsets. It is the equipment that have locked them out. When workplace tools and the environment is designed around everyone, including women, smaller sized Asians, disabled people, older people, you can see how much more inclusive we are. We are not shutting people out. Women have different physical needs too. And we've all seen the debate, should women be given menstrual leave? One young man, Lukman Awaludin, who runs his own furniture business, Bruti and Bussy, just went and did it after seeing his own female staff in pain every month. He said, Women should not be ashamed or stigmatized when applying for period leave. Employees should feel comfortable informing their employees that they are on menstrual leave. So can we see more men be understanding like this? In fact, actually, you know, women too, because none of this, oh, I had periods, bad periods, women these days are too soft. Can we just stop it? If it was tough for us, then let's make it easy for the women who follow us. These SMEs are trying to make it easier and more inclusive for women to be empowered in their various industries, but we can't leave it to a handful of SMEs. It's like putting band-aids on bullet holes. Thank you, Taylor Swift. Gender, inequ uh, gender inequities in the working world is systemic and structural. It means we have to question the very core of how we work, where we work, and why we work. We can all do this. How? First, listen to the women in your company, their hopes and their dreams, their worries and barriers. Second, recognize that the people who work for us are humans. They are not robots. They are not assets, resources, or capital. Humans. And humans break down. Thrive well who has done tremendous work in recognizing women's mental health, including high rates of depression through their program, Kami Sembang. Deloitte UK reported that 28% of people had left or wanted to leave their employers during and since the pandemic. Out of these, 61% was due to poor mental health, especially more among women. So if you want to retain your women employees and help them rise, recognizing mental health is key and check whether your workplace is causing them anxiety. How can you alleviate that? Design your workplaces around your people as these SMEs have modeled so beautifully, which now leads me to the winners for the 2022 Malaysia WEP's Awards SME Champions. The second runner up, Pentago Group. 
first runner up, Bruti and Bussy. And the winner, Thrive Well. Congratulations to all the awardees. It was such a pleasure reading and learning about the excellent work you do. So from Nottingham, England, well done. Congratulations to all our SME champions this year. Uh, as mentioned, there's been an incredible uh, number of applications and these are the, our winners for this category. So I would like to invite to our virtual stage, uh, Alicia Othman, Managing Director of Thrive Well, to say a few words. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, um, uh, Anima and um, you and women. Um, with web uh, esteemed judges and lead women for this opportunity and recognition. Um, the team and I are both humbled and truly excited to be among such outstanding initiatives. And uh, please allow me to dedicate this award firstly to all the mothers and the female community leaders we have worked with every day through our community mental health programs. To my team, the Thrive Well team, for championing the rights and practices of mental health and well being for all, despite the limitations um, and stigma that we know in the community, and our counterparts um, in the SME community engagement um, sector as well. As a social enterprise, Thrive Well's mission is to provide trauma informed community mental health services. What it essentially means, we provide mental health care. services to, to with vulnerable and at risk populations, particularly women in low income communities. And our approach is we address the social, economic and cultural barriers and particularly stigma for these women in low income communities to access mental health. So we bring these services to them in the short and medium term and in the long term, develop their leadership in terms of being mental health advocates. And during and after the pandemic, we observed the compounding toll it took on these um, women, which tripled because of the traditional stereotypical expectations and responsibilities placed on them. Um, we observed you know, that they needed financial support they needed food on the table. They needed ways to ensure their children's continued education. They needed skills and time to care for their elderly family members. But what was not being talked about was their time and space to unload all of these enormous stressors. So this is where we strive to provide a system of care for the caregivers. And our Kami Sembang program provides this safe space to ensure that these women are seen, heard, validated, and cared for. And simply by talking about the struggles, it empowers them to find solutions in their families and communities. Um, importantly for them, they recognize when they are overwhelmed, when they're spiraling out of control, when they have maybe harmful effect to themselves and their families. They then learn to reach out the, to the right support, the right resources within their means and their system, and to collectively support together with other women in their community. And this system of care is where our partnerships within and outside the sector come into play. We work with organizations and groups that provide support for education, nutrition, physical health, and urban spaces, because we believe that mental health cannot be looked as distinct from any of these basic needs. So instead of sharing, you know, I was thinking sharing a specific story of the women, I'd like to highlight a more common story, a story of work in progress, one where more often than not, it is one step forward and three steps back for these women and for us also who are working in these communities. And then sometimes 10 steps to the left, 10 steps to the right, and sometimes coming back to that zero. Um, however, the sheer grit and perseverance of these women continue to inspire us. And we work with, with, with them, um, you know, we, we journey with them. And I would say they deserve every bit of our appreciation and awe. And their journey of mental health and social well-being is one that is constantly moving and evolving and interacting 
with all the daily aspects of their daily lives as well as the adversity that they continue to face. So all we can hope for and work towards is strengthening our foundational inner resilience and improving their support system. So to wrap up, once again, I thank the UN Women, UN Web and Lead Women for this award. It's truly an honor and we won't be able to do this also with our partners and funders, um, which I will name, Yayasan Hasana, CIMB Islamic Bank, CIMB Foundation, Massing Foundation, Alliance Malaysia, Women of Will, Think City, BFM, Souls 247, and various community residents and university associations. We have only just begun in our work in progress journey, and I hope we can continue to collectively build the Kami Sembang Mothers Network of Resilience and Community Leadership with more women across Malaysia. Congratulations again to all the winners and awardees, and thank you so much. Thank you and congratulations, Alicia and the team at Thrive Well as well as to our other SME champions. And you'll get to hear a little bit more of the other um, the other SME champions and their initiatives in our breakout room sessions later on. Now, moving on, we are finally in our last uh, category for the award ceremony today, which is the leadership commitment category. Now, this award recognizes individuals, uh, individual leaders, both men and women, who have been actively championing and setting strong corporate commitments to promote gender equality in the workplace, marketplace, or community. Now, to share their reflections and also present the award, I would like to invite to our virtual stage, Dr. Wong Lai Yong, board member of Penang Women's Development Corporation and Mito Denko Corporation, as well as Shamila Ravindran, board advisor of Lean in Malaysia and principal at Mrs. Ravindran. Over to our virtual stage. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Thank you for the opportunity and opportunity as a judge in the leadership category. I was so much proud to see that not only um, the leaders in Malaysian operations of uh, multinational corporations embedded and implementing the gender equality, but also our homegrown Malaysian-based companies are with leaders truly believe in gender equality and are walking the talk. What stood out to me overall are two folks. Number one, putting in continuous efforts to place women in the decision-making positions while measuring and monitoring the results. And number two, progressive corporations have gone beyond cost concern by providing fringe benefits beyond the mandated requirements. So um, our leaders uh, clearly shown us that uh, they put in effort in the uh, paid parental leaves for both parents uh, beyond the mandated requirements. Flexible working hours to cater to the life stages of the employees, even before the pandemic, is also prevalent. This shows that our leaders realized that women and talent empowerment, as well as their satisfaction level, outweigh the cost. Another point that touched me was our applicants well understand that Gender equality in the workplace is not one size fits all kind of thing. They listen to the ground, they craft and implement initiatives to address what fits the company and the industry the most. Regarding the progress, what I see is leaders in the traditionally male-dominated industries initiated and practicing women empowerment, not only in their own organizations, but they are also uh, taking one step forward to share the practices with peers in the same industry. So thus uh, contributing to raise the standards of women empowerment in the overall industry. There is even an applica application that showing leader called the team to sign the petition to table the anti-sexual harassment bill in the uh, Malaysian parliament. Moving forward, as someone who is in the corporate sustainability field, I would like to recommend three, three points. Number one, uh, from the equity point of view, 
looking at the pay gap between the male and female employees and putting in effort for disclosure. And number two, regardless of the size of the company, utilizing the framework of ESG, environment, social and governance, while positioning DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion, beyond gender equality in the category of uh, social S. Number three, fully include male management and staff, regardless of their background, in the process and implementation of DEI, to avoid the sentiment that, oh, now all of the focus and attention is on women and we can all enjoy gender equality and harmony. Congratulations to all the great effort of the applicants. It was such a pleasure reading your work, which moved DEI forward. So, Shamila, what about you? Thanks, Layo. Uh, it wasn't an easy task assessing these applications. What stood out for me was the depth of thought, planning, effort and work these participants have put in place to ensure the call for diversity is answered. The participants this year are very diverse in terms of industry, size and needs, but I'm truly heartened by the standards that have been set by the participants this year. This year, the participants have clearly done the research gathered the data, identified the key areas for work and put together teams to support the diversity agenda within our community. Overall, what stood out for me was how these organizations have successfully identified within their own industry a gap or a need, and they have used their own expertise, skills and knowledge to fill that gap. My observation was that some applications were drafted really well uh, but the form of format isn't what I was looking for. The, my key was to cut through the form and go straight to the heart of the matter. And for me, the heart of the matter has and will always be the impact that these programs create. My recommendation to participants is to focus more on the impact of your initiatives uh, and create a pipeline of leaders who believe in the diversity agenda and can carry on this wonderful work that is needed. The research has been done, the data has been gathered. It is time for us to move to the next stage and bring these much needed changes to our community. For me, the key to success is sustainability and practicality. And it'll be most interesting to learn how these participating organizations create, sustain, engage their progress and the success of their initiatives. We will now announce the awardees for the 2022 Malaysia WEPS Awards Leadership Commitment category. The second runner-up is Chiu Kuk Ying from Wong & Partners, member firm of Baker McKenzie International. And the first runner-up is Ong Ji Lian, Executive Director, Gamuda Engineering, Gamuda Group Chief, Sustainability and Communications Officer. Congratulations. And the winner is Johari Mustafa, CEO of Forest Interactive. Congratulations. We would now like to invite Johari to say a few words. Over to you, Johari. Thank you, Dr. Wong and... Shamila for the, the judge, for sharing the judging criteria earlier. Very good morning to all of you, participants, and also the online audience we have today. I do apologize in advance if there's any audio issues that might happen in the next few minutes. And so I'm receiving this award on behalf of our organization all the way from here in Andorra. It's about 10,000 kilometers away from where many of you might be there in Malaysia. So it's an honor to join the ranks of the awardees and the finalists of the UN Women Empowerment Principle Reps Award this year. Forest Interactive is in mobile communication, so also tech. And has also been mentioned by an, in the, in an industry peer and award winner, Ms. Norlida, earlier. It has always been one that has been dominated by male leaders. So here, I'm part of that. we are actively working on increasing a balanced representation across our organization. I'm proud to say today that 63% of 
of our senior leadership positions are dominated by women. Of our regional managers are women, and forty-seven percent, and increasing of our workforce are women. Making an effort to recognize unconscious bias during the hiring process alone is not enough. We are also promoting the workforce, rather than the playing field for our talents, so that. Everyone has access to career advancements, and maintaining a safe space for them to have their voices heard. Aside from this, one of our core focused sustainable development goals is SDG five, or gender equality. The SDGs have helped us see how we can measure our efforts and progress, and our values as a company. Have always been to champion women empowerment in the workplace. We also follow out anti-harassment policies, covering sexual and other issues, and implemented detailed grievance mechanism this year throughout the organization. This is the kind of culture we embody, one that's innovative, provides accountability, and provides talent the assurance that. Without ever being penalized, we may not have the same resources that bigger companies have, but we can still be the one to set an example to achieve gender equality and the workplace, especially in the modern workplace. Of course, we will not be able to fix the issues and programs that the current commitment. I do passion to do what's best for everyone. Our talents constantly keep us on our toes, telling us that we're not just about that individual. Our existing relationship with organizations such as Lead Women, Women's Aid Organization, All Women's Action Society, and many more, have helped guide us to where we are today. We're always thinking of for the ones that don't speak up as often. We talk to our interns, fresh graduates that just join, and we show how team and both in the whole of it. Never stop learning and adapting. We trust the team. And while it's in the face, they will also be the adapts. I hope to continue learning from our own talents. And everyone here in this award ceremony, thank you very much for this recognition given. Thank you so much, Johari, for still joining us from miles and miles away. Uh, and, and congratulations again to all our awardees for this leadership category, Jillian, Kirking, and of course, Johari, our champion this year. Now, um, I just want to say at this point, we are done giving out all our awards for all the categories. So congratulations again to all our runner-ups as well as our winners. So everybody, if you could just give a virtual applause to, on the reaction button or even on your video, uh, you will have an opportunity in the next 15 minutes to really speak to all our winners today, um, our runner-ups as well as our champions in the breakout room. But before that, I would like to do a big photo session, uh, a group photo with everybody here joining in today. And I know we have a huge, huge crowd. So please um, switch on your camera, I'll give everybody a few seconds to get camera ready. And also for our team and in the back end to be on standby to take the photos. Like you, we've been doing this for a few years now. So with all virtual photos, please make sure to hold your smile for a few seconds longer. Um, so if everybody is ready, I would give everyone a few seconds. I see the Bruti and Bessie team also sharing a screen. I think that is great. <laughs> Um, all right, our team Atika, I will leave you to count us down. I can see a few um, videos also turning on. For all our attendees, we'd like you to be part of it as well. So if you're camera ready, please switch them on. Great. I'll... 
lovely to see a lot of new faces, familiar faces as well. Okay, I'll give people 10 more seconds to turn on their cameras. So we do have a few screens. Um, so we'll be taking a few shots. Uh, so please just keep your cameras on until we give you the cue to switch them up. <laughs> okay, um, Afrika and our team's photographer, please uh, cue us, count us down. Is everyone ready? Three, yes. two, one, smile. Three, two, one, smile. One more. Three, two, one, smile. Thank you. Apologies. Thank you so much, everybody. It's lovely to see everyone's faces. We will be sharing the photos on our social media. So do follow us there on LinkedIn. And then we will be tagging everybody as much as many people as we can onto that post and do share that around once it's up. Okay, for the next 15 minutes, you will have an opportunity to choose which breakout room you would like to enter. So we will not be randomly assigning our participants, but we will assign our speakers um, into the, their respective rooms. So once it is open, you will receive a pop-up message on your screen where you can choose which rooms you can uh, join. So there'll be a join button at the end here. So we have a list of instructions. Um, so do click, uh, just click on the join button and then you'll be automatically moved into that breakout room to speak to the runner-ups as well as the winners. And we'll be also be giving a few minutes for the runner-ups to share uh, their own initiatives and, and how they've been able to implement it as well. So it is also an opportunity for you to ask them your questions. So how did they convince senior management? What were their challenges? What inspired them to, to do this? Uh, what keep, what sustains their motivation? It could be good questions that you can ask. And we will have a lead women team in each of the rooms to help moderate the session and ensure that we, in, we get to hear from everybody in the room. So uh, after the end of the 15 minutes, we'd like everybody to return back to this main session so that we can formally close off the awards ceremony. So I will now leave it uh, to Trisha to open the breakout rooms. And then to all our attendees, please make use of this time to really speak to our awardees and hear from them. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome to the Leadership Commitment Room. Just give us a few minutes and we'll let people join us before we start. Hello, good morning. Hi, Anne. Hi, hi, Gillian. Hi, Kirk. It's been a while. How are you? Good, good. Yeah, it's been a while. Good to see you. Yes, <laughs> always, always, you. Champ yeah, always championing <laughs> the cause. <laughs> okay. Just Hi Anne, you. nice to meet you as well. Hi Anne. Sorry. <laughs> hi Anne, good to see you yes. again. <laughs> hey, hi Layong. Hi Anne, you look so different today. <laughs> so hey, I'll cut it short. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations again to all winners. <laughs> okay, I think we've got about 10 in our room and we're running kind of on time, so um, I'd like to be able to kick it off to give some time for the runner-ups to share a little bit. So let's just give us another a minute, and then I think we've got about 10 in our room. Um, okay, there are a few more coming in, so just, just a few minutes. Okay, mindful of time, I'm going to start. So welcome everybody and uh, uh, welcome to the Leadership Commitment Room. And I think this is a very important award because it really, you know, a lot of it starts from the top and make, making sure organizations then are able to drive these initiatives and drive it with complete empowerment. So before we get started, I want to once again congratulate Johari, Forest Interactive. And I know Forest Interactive has been so, so um, forward on this area. We had 
uh, Nenlin shared yesterday on some of the uh, initiatives and there's just so much going on. Not enough time to talk to, to Nenlin and get the questions answered. So we'll probably do separate sessions around this area uh, at a time that allows us uh, more time for this. So once again, welcome. And we want to really create this room for the opportunity for the runner-ups to actually share a little bit about the work that you are doing. And it's great to see that we have runner-ups from Gamuda and from uh, Wong and Partners, two industries that are very tough industries for women, I think. Uh, you know, Gamuda being the construction industry where you see quite a lack of women at the top. So Gillian, I know you're doing good work and pushing very hard. And Kirk, we had a discussion yesterday and we, we talked about how the legal uh, practice can be very tough on women as well. And sometimes, um, uh, uh, you know, areas of harassment, et cetera, could be quite an area to deal with. So great to have you both as runner-ups and share a little bit about the work you're doing. So to kick us off, but I will uh, invite Gillian to first share for five minutes, and then I'll invite you, Kirk, and if you have some time, we'll run a few questions, okay? All right, sure. so Gillian, why don't you start us off? Sure, thanks, uh, thanks Anne, and uh, Hathis, congratulations to the rest. And um, I'll keep this quite informal since it's quite a small group. So uh, firstly, I'm very honoured to be the first runner-up for the UN Women Asia Pacific WP Award um, under the Leadership Commitment category. Thank you to the organising committee and the judges for this recognition. Um, to be very honest, it has been a very worthwhile journey for me. Very possible only because of the support from the Muda's top management, the senior women leaders as well as lead women. I have been... Uh, a beneficiary of the Lead Women program for the last five years. And it's something where I continue to advocate uh, as I myself become a mentor within Gamuda and always encourage the ladies in their 30s to join Lead Women programs. So when I joined, when I first joined Gamuda, um, I saw how my seniors and colleagues aspired to do their best for each other. And I knew at that time it was the right place to make a change. So dialing back to when I was a young mother of twins while managing the communications for Malaysia's largest infrastructure project at that time, it wasn't easy for over 50 kilometers. So juggling and striving to give the best at work and at home was really a challenge. At that same time, many working women around me were actually choosing to quit their jobs for the very same reason. Our top management noticed the women's turnover rate and we had a town hall to address this issue. So at that time, I volunteered myself to be part of the committee to make a change. So I suggested establishing a work child center to ease the burden of working mothers, which wasn't very common at that time at the office premise. It seems easy to just set up a daycare, but actually it wasn't. It took us two years with other female colleagues to make it happen. But today, many women have come up to me, my fellow colleagues, and say how convenient it is for them to work without worrying about their children. Over the course of seven years, our daycare has benefited not only the mothers, but also the fathers and the grandfathers at Gamuda who appreciate this facility. So career progression has always been a topic for women. We should not leave anyone behind in our efforts to place women at the center of our diversity and inclusion. It's so much so that we have established the Gamuda the, sorry, the Gamuda Women Empowerment Network in 2018 with just one single sole purpose, to support women employees by providing opportunities for career advancement. Today, in the company, like myself, many women are helming top positions within the group. Fast forward to this year, or even 2021, we launched the Sustainability Gamuda Green Plan 2025, a proposal that I personally put up and changed. It has changed my career path. The awareness of ESG in Malaysia was not heightened at that time, especially in the construction industry. So when Gamuda expanded our business internationally, I realized the future of our global projects was also dependent on our sustainability efforts. That was the turning point for Gamuda and myself. Human somehow has an innate drive to grow. It's about personal fulfillment. So I took it upon myself to be a subject matter in sustainability with the support from the company. I pursued my master's in sustainable development while still continuing my work and help drive the sustainability agenda for the group, as today I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for Gamuda. So the comprehensive Gamuda Green Plan, which was launched in 2021, and charts very tangible ESG dimensions over the next five years. Today, 
it has become the group main's ESG driving force, a testament to not only the commitment to leadership, but also to the group's commitment in addressing climate change. So in all this and all, women in leadership will only happen when we, as women, truly begin to lift each other, which is why I strongly advocate for the Lead Women programs. Most importantly, one needs self-cultivation to succeed. My, my, my very last slide, which is very close to my heart, is many people have asked me, do you need to choose between career and family? I will personally say that no, choose to have it all is never one or the other. Thank you. That, you know, a long time ago when that question is asked, the resounding answer is yes. But today you're right, you know, you can basically do both because there's so much support uh, in the system. So thank you. I mean, really a mark of a leader to take on the helm and drive the change. And I think that's what it takes. So congratulations again, uh, Gillian. And just to let you know that last year, the leadership commitment was won by your mentor, Elizabeth Lee. So I'm sure yes, she'll I be know. Really <laughs> to, to see you do this this year. So thank you for that. And I'm gonna quickly move on to Kirk. So Kirk, can you take on a few minutes and share with us the work that you've done? Thanks and thanks. Uh, I think firstly, uh, allow me to thank uh, UN Women and also the organizers of WEP Awards Malaysia for selecting me as the second runner-up in the leadership commitment category. So I'm deeply grateful and honored uh, by this award. And I share this with my fellow partners, the firm's inclusion and diversity committee, and also all my colleagues uh, at Wong and Partners. I've been involved in IND work uh, since the start of my career. That's uh, very, very long ago. But those days, uh, I think the theme is not as uh, as open and as transparent as, as, as it is now. I, I'm, I'm actually very encouraged by what has been happening, at least in Malaysia, even for the last 10 years. I think the, 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 the talking points, the agenda-driven uh, and cutting across a lot of organizations in terms of DNI, I think is really on the rise. I've also been honored to have been chosen to drive the diversity inclusion program in our firm for the last eight years. So we looked at... Uh, Sorry, Kirk, we can't hear you, Kirk. Can you try again? Yeah. Uh, Sorry, yeah. I think maybe. Yeah. I, is this better? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so sorry. Yeah. So I was just saying that um, I, I was honored to have been uh, chosen to drive the DNI uh, program for our firm for the last eight years. So we have looked at many in initiatives. We look at it internally and also externally as well. Internally, we have run a lot of programs. For example, uh, we started off with focusing on building a, a mother's room for all uh, breastfeeding mothers. Uh, we looked into sexual harassment policies. Uh, we looked into uh, unconscious bias issues within the firm. We work with our recruitment uh, team uh, to make sure that the principles and policies are implemented at that level. We also look into cultural diversity. We have a lot of social events uh, in our firm. We also work with the social com to make sure that while we are running a lot of these uh, social events within our firm, we are also very conscious about cultural diversity as well. Um, and another big uh, uh, agenda for us in the last few years was really um, our more uh, senior lawyers who have, of course, uh, uh, at a stage where they have young uh, babies, we are looking into flexible working hours. That was a, a little challenging initially, but I think over time. I think we managed, even pre-COVID, we already have a flexi uh, uh, hours available uh, to our lawyers in our firm. But of course, with, with COVID, uh, I think that almost just entrenched uh, uh, that, that issue. So I think I'm, I'm grateful for COVID, at least uh, for that. And, and we also looked externally as well, yeah, because as a law firm, we want to see where we can fit uh, uh, in, in this space. Uh, we want to work with external organizations. I think we have worked with you as well and with lead women. Uh, we are also looking towards to work with our clients as well. So we are also seeing our clients having DNI committees. So we are collaborating with them. So I think that's a part we find, at least I find now um, uh, quite interesting and encouraging because we are reaching out and they are reaching out to us as well to collaborate at the DNI space. So I, I'm really uh, happy to see this development. I think it is really the collective effort of everyone in the room. 
yeah, plus organizations, plus uh, commercial organizations as well, who are actually uh, passionate about uh, this, this area and is actually collectively moving this uh, forward. So I think um, just want to end by saying that uh, this accolade really serves as an encouragement for myself, my firm, to keep working towards entrenching all these uh, uh, values in our workplace. And it is a significant milestone on our journey towards creating a, a safer and respectful working environment. So thanks again, Anne, and thanks uh, you and women for this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, really good work, you know, and, and I know I've worked with both your organizations, not as much with Forest Interactive, but they have come very visible in the last few years with, to, to our organization and the work that you're doing as well. So, so I, I just want to say thank you and congratulations and continue that work because, you know, it takes that really to keep the conversations going within and in the ecosystem that, that we work uh, in. So what I'd like to do at this point is really to, to open it for some questions. Uh, we have a few people with us. Anybody here that would like to, to ask uh, the three awardees uh, with us here any questions with regards to their leadership and how they have driven that commitment? Anyone? It's a small room, so you can just basically voice over your question and uh, we can take that to further discuss it. No, we have quite a quiet room. Okay, then let me kick off a question before uh, everybody else. So, I mean, you've, you've all done so much in your area. So my question to you is, what's the next big thing you want to do in terms of really driving your organization and progressing it forward? What would be that space or that area that you feel you want to work on? Maybe I'll jump in first, Anne. Yep. Yes, Kirk. Yeah, so because it is something that, in fact, uh, we have been thinking about uh, because we have also evolved and grown over the years in these uh, DNI themes and space. Uh, so we also ask ourselves, you know, as a law firm, you know, where can we significantly contribute to make, I would say, yeah, make, make a mark or, or you know, uh, help to move the needle a little. So we have actually decided uh, this year to uh, really move into the space where we want to support uh, the women on boards. Uh, that means, um, you know, to 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 help uh, mm -hmm. equip uh, uh, women on board. So we are actually uh, working. In we have reached out to the thirty percent club uh, to to mm -hmm. see where uh, you know we can actually do trainings. Uh, you know, because we are where we we do directors trainings all the time. So mm -hmm. we want to actually uh, contribute in in that space where we feel that. Uh, you know, we can help the women heading towards this direction to give them more confidence, to give them more knowledge, to equip them uh, more. Because as, as lawyers, we are able to give the kind of legal training that's required for before you step onto boards. Uh, so I think that's the space that we have identified uh, uh, that we wish to do uh, going forward. Yeah. Okay, great. I think that's something so needed, though the numbers are moving, but it still still has a long way to go. And, and truly, if we have women at the top, we can see change like this happening uh, as well on the ground. Anybody else? What about Johari and Gillian? What are your next big things? Maybe no. I'll chip in. Um, from my observation in the last two years with the pandemic, uh, we realize the women numbers are maintaining at the entry level and in the middle management, but it, re but it remains stagnant at the middle management. And the trend has kind of changed on the reasons why women do not want to take up more. Um, I think it's, it's the, I wouldn't say it's the fear, but it is the notion that, you know, with the pandemic, with the pandemic everyone prioritized yeah, what's important in their life and they realized a career advancement just takes too much of yeah, waking hours. And, you know, a lot of opportunities are given to women to be promoted. And a lot of people have turned down and said, no, we are happy where we are now just to be a manager or a senior manager. So I think this is something where uh, uh, we are actively looking into the, resign the reasons behind this. And uh, while it's good that uh, more women are taking up, like, for example, trainings to be at the board and stuff like that, I think the equal pay is something where we should look into and which is something where it's not disclosed. 
could be quite sensitive to actually know the disparity of the pay gaps. But I think this is something where I think all of us should hold hands and really look into this matter. Yeah, thank you for that too, Julian. I mean, I, I agree with you. And I think a lot of the organizations are seeing that middle band as a major issue, right? And so programs that we offer really is to strengthen that and get their strength and belief in themselves to move forward. But there's a lot of work there. And I like the fact you're looking at equal pay in a very sensitive area. In some countries, they're forcing them to disclose it uh, so that they can really see that there is a gap. Because today, when you ask organizations, they say, no, it's all equal. But somewhere in the system, something is not happening right, and this gap still exists, right? Uh, and maybe from you, Johari, what, 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 is, what are your thoughts in your organization? Thank you, Anne. I, I guess I could echo what uh, Gillian mentioned earlier. I think the um, opportunity has always been been given, you know, in our organization, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've got 62% of our, or 63% of our senior leadership, you know, headed by women. Um, it's also the ability for us to, to support them, um, especially when it comes to, um, uh, you know, climbing up the ladder, you know, whether that's that extra, um, promotion or um, they, you know, the, that support, that that uh, really close support is is really necessary. And you know, um, sometimes they they just don't have the confidence to say, hey, you know, I'm I want to if I do take up that the senior role, you know, how's it gonna take up my time, or is that gonna create more stress or more responsibility? And I think guiding guiding them, you know, um, to ensure that, you know, they, they get all the assistance they want to assume into that role is, is very important because, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. One might think that you can naturally, you know, assume a position, a higher position. It, well, it's, it's, it's not, you know, it, it really affects a lot of the um, stability and in well, I see women talent, and it's really important that you know you, you reach out to them and you ask them, you know, oh, what are the challenges that you think you might face mentally or you know at personally, and and I think that bond is is important um, to make sure that uh, you know they're able to carry that on and and uh, um, also um, uh, you know ascend to that senior leadership role. Yeah, thank you for that. And it's true, you know, I think women need that extra bit of uh, confidence in terms of pushing them a little bit over the edge sometimes, otherwise it may not happen naturally. So I think, you know, just that awareness that we all have and what it takes is what's going to help us drive this um, even further and faster. So I want to thank you all and I want to congratulate each and every one of you for, for getting to being recognized in this category. And I can hope that you will continue the great work you're doing. And I also want to encourage you to be a part of our community. I know, Kirk, we're picking up on the corporate community. Remember, we had it before COVID. So we're going to start this corporate community because we want this conversation to continue. We want it to get traction. We want it to reach all the organizations that we have not been able to reach. So we will be reaching out to each one of you. And in the meantime, thank you and have a great day. We're going to be returning to our rooms now. I'll see you in the main room. Thanks, Anne. You are all interested to learn a little bit more about the transparency and reporting. Uh, yes, the transparency and reporting category and hearing from Natalia. So uh, maybe I, I'll just kick it off, Natalia. So um, how you shared a little bit about how you've uh, so implemented or your leadership has implemented. Have you actually faced any pushback in terms of the data that you are recording or and also how did you identify which sort of indicators to start measuring? Um, well, thanks, Lisa. Um, well, firstly, hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here to share what we've done. But, you know, as much as I'm happy to share, I'm also happy to listen to what you have in mind what you've done in your organization to also learn from all of you. So Lisa, uh, to answer your question, no, we have not received any feedbacks, uh, any pushback specifically on the data that we collect and the insights that we provide. 
Um, and then second part of your question, I think, is about how how would we decide, right? What 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 to measure, yeah, how to measure, measure it. Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it obviously it starts with our objectives. Um, as a company, we have our company vision. And then from there, we build our strategy on the different areas. And as the CHRO of Maxis, I am responsible for the people strategy. And one of the pillars of our people strategy is about building an inclusive and diverse workforce. And in that, we have we our focus is on three areas, um, particularly to build more young talent. Um, second is to build more female leaders. And third is to build more technology leaders, technology employees, and within that technology, more female talent in technology. So going back to you know, this, this particular award, um, based on that objectives and the strategy that we have, we then track those areas. So we track young talent, we track women at leadership role, we track technology talent and technology, women um, in technology roles. So going back to this award is those two things, is women in leadership role and women in technology roles. So once we agree that we are going to track those measurements, because those measurements relate back to our strategy and vision, we then look at how do we define technology. So that was another exercise that we had to do because technology roles traditionally used to be only in technology related departments, but that's no longer the case, right? There's a lot of tech um, skills and tech roles across the company, even in HR. So once we've decided we want to focus on women in leadership role and women in technology role, we then define what technology roles are. Based on that, we then develop that internal dashboard using employee data that we have. And once we have that dashboard, ensuring that the dashboard first is very secure, second is that the data is accurate and we can get on-time data, we then from there develop the insights. And that is what helps the managers and leaders to really look at their division and the department at a very, you know, the smallest department level to see where do I have enough female in technology roles? Do I have enough female in leadership roles? Whatever action items that we decide to put in place, it's very targeted because we believe that we cannot have, not all action items can be company-wide because it's not relevant to every single, you know, uh, um, uh, pockets of the company. So really that's kind of how we decided what to, which, you know, which matrix to, to measure and, and, you know, and how, uh, how we did it. But because, I'm sorry, just going to go yeah. back to your first question, because you can't argue with data, right? Um, we've not had any pushback because we're sure the data is accurate. The insights are very much coming from the data. It's more about the discussion point is more about the action plans. Yeah, I think I do have a few follow-up questions, but that's uh, on my side. I just want to allow our attendees here in, in the room the opportunity to ask Natalia any questions that you might have. Um, with regards to uh, measuring, building out the dashboard. Also, um, I think collecting data is one thing, is understanding that and then implementing the right actions, right, and getting the buy-in. So any, question, uh, any questions from the floor? Else I'll ask my own questions. <laughs> okay, I think, feel free to unmute yourselves, yeah, or raise your hand so I'll know. Uh, but I think everybody is just sort of digesting the information and, and trying to see how it applies to their organization. Um, maybe, Natalia, I can sort of move beyond the, the recording or the collecting of the data. Maybe probe, understand a little bit more about the action taken um, mm. after you've identified the data. Right? So like you said, uh, maybe I just focus on the two data points or whether insights you've gathered, which is the leadership, women in leadership and women in tech technology. So once you've identified where they are sort of maybe perhaps lack of representation or the numbers are not there yet, um, and then you're trying to sort of move the needle in that space, right? So this, how do you balance between the need to ensure that you have the best people for the roles and also ensuring that the numbers improve? It, you know, mm -hmm. how have you been able to strike that balance? Right. So. Um, 
I think Oli mentioned it in her uh, acceptance speech earlier, right? It's not about asking people to hire women in leadership role or in technology role. It's about making sure we create that equal playing field in terms of being considered for the role. The merits for the role, the suitability for the roles is never um, taken away from the selection process. Um, so in, for example, in technology roles, based on my experience, what you see is that when you look at the submissions that we receive for a very technical roles, we typically see more men applying for those roles. Um, it could be a case of because there are more men who are who have that experience in their in their work life, or it could be because typically those are the roles that we, men find more attractive to to apply for. So what we do is we ensure that we have enough options for managers and leaders to select for that particular technical roles. We have, sorry, we have sufficient enough female candidates for the role. So it's not about pushing, you know, for the female candidates or talents to be hired, but ensuring there is that equal playing field when it comes to selecting. And so going back to the dashboard that we have, we know which roles, which leadership level, which department that have that could have more female to, to add to the diversity, which then creates better business decisions and a more inclusive environment. We then, for roles within that space, we make sure that we have more candidates who are female being considered for the role. But the decision is still based on culture fit, skills, suitability for the role. Great. Yeah, I, I like that it's very intentional, at least in the pooling stage. So, and, and this is sort of a few, the same recurring questions that we get when we talk about this, like ensuring that there are enough women candidates applying. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say in reality, there is not. So how, how do you actually actively go out um, to mm -hmm. get the female candidates, is there is is it something that Maxis proactively takes, or you sort of just ensure that the job description has gender neutral mm -hmm. languaging and and publishing it on the right platforms? But is there another step that that your recruitment and hiring team does uh, to mm -hmm. to raise the visibility of these female candidates? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so firstly, we need to make sure that as a workplace, as an employer, we are welcoming and inviting and attractive to female talents, right? So we need to make sure we provide the right work environment, um, the right benefits, the right um, culture to make sure that women want to work for Nexus. I think that's the starting point because it's not about going to where female talent are, but it's about them wanting to be part of us. And that can only happen if we provide the relevant solutions and culture and, a, and you, know, a, you know, a working environment to them. So it starts with that. And we do that by working with, through um, employee surveys. So we do surveys um, on a regular basis to hear from our employees where, what are the areas that we're doing well, what we can do better um, in many different areas. One of it is how do we make sure we are inclusive for women? Second is creating that awareness and education amongst our employees. Everyone has the right intention in wanting to be exclusive, but some people might not, might not, might, might need more help to, to be educated, to be to be given more awareness on the right behaviors to encourage, to, to be inclusive and encourage diversity. So we also build awareness programs for the whole company as well as for the managers, because it's really important that leaders. Um, are inclusive in, in the way they lead um, their, their teams. So with the right work environment, with the right awareness, um, that is culture. That is super critical. You know, that's, that's really how we work with each other. And how we work with each other will define all the other things that we do um, in the company. So with, with the right work environment, with the right awareness and education, with the right culture, then we go to the right to the right places where we can find the right talent that we, we are looking for. So we work with many different universities, talent partners, where we can um, give 
the talent out there an opportunity to get to know Maxis and the opportunity to say, yes, I would like to be part of the Maxis family. And some of these talent partners that we work, we work with are specifically talent partners that focus on women um, in technology space, for example. So, so we create the right place and then we go out there to speak to the right people and then, you know, and then if it, if it works right for both us and the talent, then we'll invite them in and we continuously improve and do better in this space. Because women, gender is just one element of diversity, right? There's also the other elements that we also focus on. Yeah, and I guess, um, I know we have five more minutes uh, left to our room. Uh, on this note, uh, I guess, what are uh, maybe going beyond gender a little bit? So because uh, some of our attendees here have been part of our Equality at Work convention that happened in the last two days. And this is also where we focus on the wider diversity and how do we ensure workplaces are inclusive also, not just on the gender side, but age, different abilities, uh, nationalities, especially for the MNCs, right? Um, so, so what else is sort of Max's focus on in terms of building um, the right workforce? What are the pillars of diversity that is a top priority? Um, so I mentioned earlier, young talent is another space that we are really growing because we, we absolutely believe in, in um, helping the youth in Malaysia to always be ahead, to help them build their career. Maxis is an amazing training ground and a growth a place for, for young talent to come in, to learn, to contribute, where we can really turn their um, ambition into, you know, into a real achievement in their career. Um, so that's another big area that we focus on. And um, so obviously, um, because it's a, a big area of focus, we also have our internal goals and we track the data to see that, to make sure that we have sufficient amount, healthy amount of young talent across the organization. Because we believe that, that young, young talent bring with them diversity of thought, um, a different exposure to life, that different generational um, you know, uh, life experience that they've had to add to that diversity of thought when we make decisions as a company. Um, so that's one area. And it's not just about having young talent be part of Maxis, but also grooming those young talent to take on leadership role in the future as future leaders, not just for Maxis, but also for the country. Yeah, I, and I know Maxis is really, um, you know, allowing leaders, regardless of age, really shine through. And I know last year, we, as part of our special generation equality category, we've actually awarded uh, Yin Lee, who is one of, um, yes. she co-founded Women and Maxis, right, I yes. think. Um, so under the youth leadership. So it really goes to show, and we're happy that Maxis is yeah. again an awardee this year for different categories. So I think... And, and Lisa, yeah, actually, you, yeah. you reminded me, you bring up a good point. You mentioned women mm. and Maxis, right? So we also yeah. believe in Maxis that it's not, it's not just about HR creating an inclusive and diverse workforce, right? I mentioned earlier about making sure our managers have the right tools, are equipped with the right skills, the right awareness to be the leader that we want them to be, to create that inclusive and diverse um, and equal workforce. So leaders are one. But another area that we, 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 we leverage on is employee resource group. We believe that it's not about, it's not about just about policy, it's about practice, it's about culture, and having employees be part of this journey to get us to the diversity goals that we want to be is, is critical. And how we get employees to be part of this is that we create employee resource groups across the company based on, you know, with, with, with specific um, interest or diverse backgrounds. For example, you mentioned women at Maxis. That's the employee resource group for women in Maxis. So we work with them as the HR team, as the people and organization team to look at policies, to look at certain things that we can do in the work environment. But they also do other things beyond what HR does. For example, they create, they, they, they have, events, they have sessions where women meet to talk about 
um, how to help each other, how to support each other to be more successful at the workplace. And we are also currently creating an employee resource group for young talent. So young talent can also meet and they are a very good data point for the people and organization team because they are telling us what they want rather than us coming up with initiatives and programs that we think is right, we ask them what they want and then we cater to their needs. And, and that symbiotic relationship is, is very healthy and is very critical to get to our diversity goals. Yeah, and I think that that really hammers down your point about building the right culture. Right? So it's not mm -hmm. a directive from HR. It's an organic sort of movement that, you know, the employees not just share with HR what they want to see in the organization, but they become part of that, that exactly. sentiment and yeah, the they yeah. do it voluntarily. They're passionate about it. Yeah. Um, and, and it has worked really well for us. Yeah, and that's great. And, and I, I, I hope that for all the attendees here listening in, that there, there are some key points that you can take away or maybe it inspires you to maybe look for a job role with Maxis if there are any openings at the moment. Uh, but I just want to say thank you uh, to Natalia for your time and sharing. I know the other breakout rooms are coming back in at, right now. Um, so for, the, for those who were in the main session listening to Natalia sharing about her work at, uh, at Maxis with regards to the transparency and reporting side of things and also beyond, if you have uh, questions that you might think of later on as well, feel free to connect um, with Natalia, I think, and uh, also, or maybe type your questions in the chat box. She'll be here for another few more minutes. I know you have to leave at 12 o'clock sharp. Uh, so, so yeah, to our attendees, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we'll wait for the rest to come back in from their breakout rooms. You know, COVID. The pandemic didn't allow us to catch up, but good to see yeah. you online. Yeah, and congratulations Fine. on this uh, award and and your the leadership. One of your leaders also uh, was awarded, right? Yes, thank you very much, Monzi. Congratulations to you too, and Sharon um, yes. for being awarded yes, as well. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's thank such you. a big congratulations to Gamuda and KPMG and. Uh, I think I have this is the first time meeting you. I have Yanling on the call as well. So she was instrumental to the submission, the submission putting everything together. But I think all, all in all, it was just so inspiring to hear your story and your learning. And, and I'm just looking forward to speak to, you know, to all of you and just to share ideas. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, Yanling. Um, good job. Uh, I'm waiting to hear your stories as well in this session. Okay, lovely, lovely, lovely ladies. Um, okay, so uh, let's uh, let let's just wait for um, people to uh, trickle in, and we can just start it off. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Trisha. I'm a DI associate consultant here at Lead Women, and I will be your room moderator. Welcome to the gender inclusive uh, workplace breakout room. Um, first of all, congratulations to all the winners in the category. We will be hearing from all our all our awardees today and you will have a chance um, to ask each other questions about your winning initiate initiatives. So first of all, congratulations to our uh, second and first runner-ups. The first runner-up is Accenture and our second runner-up is KPMG, uh, who will be sharing their winning speech and work with us here. Uh, without further ado, I would like to now invite our first runner-up from Accenture, Miss um, Sharon Fan, the Inclusion and Diversity Lead from Accenture, uh, to deliver their winning speech and share more about their work. Over to you, Sharon. Thank you so much, uh, Trisha, for the kind words. Um, I think many thanks as well to the UNWP and Lead Women, uh, Lead Women as well, um, for this amazing award. And uh, you know, it's just an honor to be part of this esteemed group of nominees and winners. Um, on behalf of Essential Malaysia, we are extremely proud and humbled to receive this recognition too. And I know I speak for everyone in Essential, and Yen is just one key person here in saying that advancing gender equality and women empowerment is a very meaningful and front and center initiative and pursuit for us and something that we are deeply passionate about. Um, in Essential, across the board and across at all levels, we believe that diversity and inclusion are multipliers to innovation and growth. You know, we champion our people's unique contributions and we strongly believe this allows our teams, you know, regardless of gender, 
to perform to their fullest potential. Um, so this is embodied in a, a lot of our overarching initiatives and countrywide initiatives as well. And IND is one of them, uh, which I lead. And we have you know, over 100 core committee members who spearhead multiple you know, sub-initiatives with gender equality being one of them. And I think it was widely touched upon a lot in this forum and rightly so, the importance of data and analysis to drive actions. So this is no different for us in Accenture. And I'm proud to share that Essential Malaysia achieved the milestone of a gender balanced workforce of over 50% women uh, representation since 2018, actually. So actually more than half a decade ahead of you know, the global goal. And I think nevertheless, we know we have so much more to do in this pursuit as, as you know, many of you in, in this call have also said the same. And we continue to drive initiatives that are essentially rooted on three focus areas. So building leaders at all levels, understanding pathways to success, and cultivating connections and caring communities. So I think some of the initiatives that we have, you know, we're spearheading at the moment are our Women you know, Paid For program and our Gender Allyship program, which we encourage our female and male mentors and advocates to you know, raise other women up and help them to build the confidence and the leadership DNA needed to step up to the next level. We also have our executive coaching program and our Lean In Circles launch as well, which we did recently for our women and also parenting circles. And, you know, specifically to empower our pipeline of community and women leaders, as well as equip us with, you know, the tools and resources to thrive in the workplace. As we know, it's a, you know, can be a very challenging and male-dominated workplace at times. Uh, we also have International Women's Day. It's our yearly countrywide event where we, you know, reflect on our progress and our advancements against key milestones that we set out to achieve, such as our gender ratio, which I mentioned, and also recruitment mix ratio, as well as, you know, regular policy reviews and enhancements that we do. Um, and, you know, there are some of the various policies that we continue to advocate in concert with you know, our amazing HR partners, uh, such as we recently enhanced our maternity and paternity leave entitlements, as well as our parental and caregiver benefits, just to name a few. And I think, you know, in pursuing all these efforts, we know that it's not something you can do alone. It takes an army. And for this, you know, I, I just want to express a huge thank you and appreciation to the whole Essential Malaysia team. Um, special call out to our country managing director, Aswan, who's our, our number one sponsor and advocate, and our leadership team as well, and our sponsors. Um, I don't think many of them are not in this call, but, um, and well, Yen Ling is in this call. Uh, we also have Christina, Chin Ching, Eleanor, and Doris, just to name a few. So thank you so much. It's been a privilege to be a part of this forum and this community. Lovely, lovely. Thank you so much for sharing that, um, uh, Sharon. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I would like to keep our Q&A session towards the end of the program so as to allow the other winner to also share their winning initiative. So without further ado, um, we have our second runner-up, uh, Ms. Monsi Siu from KPMG, Executive Director of People, Performance and Culture at KPMG. Um, the floor is yours, Ms. Monsi. Ms. Monsi, I'm sorry. Uh, over to you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, Trisha, and uh, really good to see Lailing here, and congratulations um, to Gamuda and Accenture. Um, I'm, I mean, we feel very humbled, right, by this award, and equally as well, we were very excited to, you know, to receive this award uh, by UN Women. Um, it's, it's actually been a, a humbling journey as well, I mean, to hear of all these many great initiatives from such a good um, corporates yeah, uh, across Malaysia. Uh, but in KPMG, uh, the gender equality and women's empowerment is actually steeped in our history. Because way back in 1924, uh, our founding partner, um, his action for inclusion, diversity and equity efforts actually helped a young lady called Ethel Watts. This is a true story. Yeah? You can Google it. Um, she he helped her be, to become the first woman to qualify as an accountant. And this was again back in the 1920s, right, where, you know, women didn't really have a voice back then. So it, it was a defining moment for KPMG. And this became embedded in our DNA towards more gender equality and women empowerment efforts. So our firm's aspiration has always been to be the employer of choice for talents out there. So whether it is, you know, for potential candidates who are thinking of joining us or for our existing employees in the workplace, we want it to make 
uh, we want to make KPMG a great place to work that matters. They come as they are, and you know the, the DNI and E um, agenda uh, allow them to thrive and grow with us while learning for a lifetime, and also being able to make their mark, you know, to be recognized for the impact they make in the firm. Uh, our female staff makes up at least 60% or more of our overall staff demographics. So for us, it was important to create an environment where they feel supported and can thrive with us because you know, we, we needed to help with uh, not only talent attraction, but also to retain them. So things like um, expanding um, the maternity leave, and this was done in 2015, you know, way before it was uh, amended in the <laughs> Employment Act, right? And it was through the support of our leadership team, in particular, our managing partner, Dato Johan, you know, who felt it was also important to show our women staff, female staff, that, hey, we, we understand also an important uh, factor in their lives. So, they were more than happy. I mean, the whole exco was more than happy to support, you know, 90 days, giving 90 days uh, maternity leave uh, uh, back then, yeah, in 2015. So that started the ball rolling in making sure that whatever else that we uh, did um, further support you know, our female um, uh, staff in the workplace. So things like um, flexible work arrangement was also started in 2015, uh, 2015, 2016. And uh, we allowed people, you know, to take career breaks, right? If they needed to extend their um, their role as a caregiver or to bring up their young, you know, young toddlers, um, and you know, their jobs are still secured, right? When they come back to us, and nothing is impacted. I mean, they they won't be, um, you know, they won't their time away won't be seen as something that would impact their career progression. So. Um, our commitment to gender equality and women's empowerment actually has resulted in retention of more females at the management level. And these are managers and above, um, which is about 60% or more. And um, at the partner level, the partnership level, uh, we have exceeded the 30% uh, so-called quota, right? Um, we, we were hovering below 30%. So it was really enlightening to see um, that it was, we hit, you know, 30% and, uh, and more. So we continue you know, to, um, to work on better initiatives and to create a much more gender inclusive environment uh, in KPMG. Um, but we again like to thank you, uh, UN Women for this award. And we also like to thank, you know, our leadership for their support. Thank you so much. Lovely. Thank you for sharing that, Monsi. Uh, we have some really outstanding and innovative awardees this year, and we are all here to learn. Uh, after hearing a little bit about the initiatives, um, you know, does anyone have questions? Uh, perhaps you would like to know more about how they did it, you know, what are some of the challenges in implementation? Um, just so you know, now is the question and answer um, session. Um, and we also have our category champion, uh, Gamuda, here with us. So do take this golden opportunity to ask away. We do have a little over seven minutes in the room left. Uh, so before I pass the floor, open the floor to questions. Um, if we do have any members of the media in the room, please identify yourself before asking your question. Otherwise, um, the floor is open uh, for your questions. Um, take it away, ladies. I would love to start, actually. Um, and I also just wanted to introduce, I'm not sure if you managed to introduce, so Elena Chong has also joined the call. So she's actually our HR lead for Essential Malaysia. So she is critical to a lot of the implementation and policies and you know women initiatives that we roll out. So thank you for being here too, Eleanor. Um, thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Yeah, and, and it's really a journey together, right? I think what's really the best part in Accenture, um, a lot of the stuff that we drive, right, is not really the HR, it's a HR doing business and business doing HR. It's all the leadership and us uh, coming together, right, to create a great place for ourselves. 
So I, I was just curious because Monty, because you just more because you just spoke, so it's fresh in my mind. You mentioned that your workplace had actually about 60% women as well, which is fantastic. It's amazing. For Essential Malaysia, we, we are also um, gender balanced, but we have other entities that are way below. I, I was just curious, you know, what are some of the key initiatives that you, you think are, are critical for, for your company? Because there's such a large population and, you know, women is the lead, the women leaders representation is so critical as is for us in Essential. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I think it's more about uh, profiling our female leaders out there. You know, when we go for uh, engagement sessions with university students or or even professional bodies, just continuing to profile uh, female leaders, yeah, be it manager or senior managers, I think will help people understand that uh, or feel safe that you know this profession is okay, yeah, for um for female um despite. Uh, all those um, rumors out there that you know it's uh, we, we work very long hours. Uh, it's it's a very tough environment. It's very challenging. No doubt it is. But there are many success stories amongst uh, part, uh, you know uh, females who have had children. They've taken career breaks, but they've come back and they've also become uh, partners. So I think profiling, continued profiling of female um, leaders, uh, would help. Great, thanks for that. Lovely. Any any other questions? Anyone else? Or else I have a question for uh, Sharon. Uh, I found that you know I was going through your application, uh, Accenture's application. I found it super interesting. You know, um, the fact that um, Accenture Malaysia has managed to achieve a gender balanced workforce uh, in 2020, which is a decade ahead of the global uh, the global team's goal. You know, um, for me, I'm curious to know, you know, what has been the crucial driving force towards achieving this goal? And like, what are some of the um, implementation strategies uh, that has helped in achieving this goal? Sure, we just did a data check this morning. It's actually since 2018 that we were <laughs> okay. So we basically saw ourselves short, but uh -huh. glad we still made it. Um, yeah, no, so I, I think um, similar to, I think what Monsi said, I think Lailing also has similar sentiments. Um, there, there are a lot of, I think it's been something that has been a long journey. Um, it has been prominent in Accenture, Malaysia, um, and Accenture globally as well. And it's, a, it's something that has been cascaded down from the global level, from Julie's suite. And, and it's something, it's a culture and <clears throat> a DNA that um, it's very, um, enforced and empowered even at our leadership level. So it's something that starts from the top to say this is an important initiative and we must um, prioritize initiatives and resources to, to drive all these initiatives. So at the leadership, we have that consensus and that support um, and advocacy. And that actually, one thing that we recognize very early on is we need to be able to touch the grassroots and, and not have it be high level or, you know, just a lip service, you know, we have to walk the talk as well. When we say, you know, we support, um, you know, work-life balance to a certain extent, I mean, there are challenges. We, you know, we, we, we have to work around working with, you know, clients and, and even internal stakeholders. But at the leadership level, we drive that message across and we live and breathe it. And because we have a large community of women leaders, so in by essence, that is representation as well. And I think the other thing that we, we recognize early on is it's not a battle we can um, fight alone. We need the, our male um, counterparts to also be on board. And we are very lucky that you know we have uh, our number one sponsor, as I mentioned during the, the, the earliest um, speech, Aswan. He's our number one advocate. So he, he is a true proponent and that is a culture and DNA that trickles down. And, and I, I feel very fortunate. I mean, I've been, Eleanor has been a firm many years and I've been a firm for almost 13 years. So I, I'm, I'm sort of a case study as well on how, whether the firm is able to support me throughout my, my journey. And I think there have been a lot of active initiatives and a lot of leaders who have walked the talk and, and and we see changes in policy, like we, we, spoke, we spoke about policy changes and enhancements to support, you know, new parents. We just launched a parenting circle actually um, to further provide, you know, another avenue um, uh, for people to share and, and, and sometimes just be heard. Um, so I think policy, um, leadership advocacy, and just um, 
a commitment, a, a commitment um, at the top and also at the you know at the grassroots to drive initiatives um, and awareness. Uh, ha having the right forms to spread these messages it, it has been sort of the key driving factors for us. Lovely, lovely. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, uh, Sharon. Sorry, Eleanor, you were going to say? No, uh, it's a well said, Sharon, right? It's a really uh, multiple year journey. I've been with the firm for close to 15 years. And um, the, the support that we given, right, not only to the women, right, of course, I can see really... Um, Besides the network, the benefits, right? When I had my first daughter, it's like three months maternity, then increased to four months and more, right? So um, now we even focus on the men, right? In terms of their paternity, we recently also just launched for their paternity up to like, you know, uh, um, 40 days, right? So it's really a culture that we're building it. Look from the 360 degree, not only from benefits, but from the community, from the leadership, so that we can really walk the talk to support our people, including ourselves. Lovely, lovely. Thank you for that addition, uh, Eleanor. Uh, I'm just uh, wary about the time right now. Um, it looks like we are running a little bit uh, aboard. Uh, it looks like everyone else is back in the main session already. So um, I will have to close this breakout room and I will see you all in the main session. Thank you so much, ladies, Amonsi, Sharon, and uh, Eleanor, as well as uh, Lily. Uh, we heard your uh, speech in the um, award ceremony itself. Thank you so much. I will see you in the main session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Congrats, you. everyone. Yes. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay, so welcome everyone. This is the breakout room for the community category. My name is Stealing from Lead Women and I'll be hosting this session. What we will be doing today is um, we will be hearing from the first runner up and you have the opportunity also to pose a few questions to them. We also have our winner with us in the room. So if you have questions, uh, we can take that later. So what we will do is first hear from the first runner up, engage with some follow-up discussion, open the floor for Q&A, you can obviously put your questions in the chat box or you can just uh, put up your hand and we will um, assign the floor to you. And we ask that you post questions that are, I guess, constructive and respectful and related directly to the initiative for the company being awarded. And then after that, we may open the session um, for the winner to um, have questions as well. So since we've already heard from our community awardee, Nolita Asmi, Group Chief People Officer from Axiata, we're going to hand the floor now to the first runner-up. Please join me in welcoming our first runner-up awardee, Radhika Agarwal, um, Huggies Marketing Manager from Kimberly Clark to say a few words. Over to you, Radhika. Thank you very much, Radhika. Um, I'd like to open the floor now to questions from the audience. Um, may we have the first question, please? Please go uh, ahead. Uh, congratulations. It's, it's, it's really a phenomenal um, a program, you know, particularly when we're talking now about a period and menstrual. And thank you, Badri, for being so enlightening to be part of this conversation without any of us flinching, right? But, but I think it really needs to, to, to come up. I, I mean, something that seems so basic, but is so, so important because you are quite right. There is a stigma. And particularly, do you find that some communities are much more... I hate to use the word marginalized, a bit more challenging for them when you were doing this program, Radhika? Because when we look at the ecosystem, different parts have different uh, push points, you know? No, definitely. I think, thank you for the question and uh, for your appreciation as well. I think there are, uh, if I were to, go to give some color to that question, the lower strata of the society, especially the B40, for them, the issue is even more real because they suffer from period poverty. So beyond period stigma and taboos, which they have to tackle at a social and a psychological level, they also suffer from real shortage of access to period products. Yeah. And therefore for them, the effort has to be more material and more real uh, at large, right? Whereas when it comes to the more urban crowd, uh, while they would be able to probably access and purchase period products, the stigma still sort of percolates even up to that level. So I think the stigma is a big issue overall, but period poverty is a high priority issue which needs to be uh, focused on the B40 community for us. Yeah. 
Thanks, Radhika. I think in the view of time, we are at Learn 55 on the dot. Thank you so much again, Radhika, Thank you. Badri, everyone, for joining us today. And please return to the main room. And we will I'll be I'll be jumping off. I've got another meeting at 12. So I got to I got to leave. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care, everybody. Take care, everyone. Bye. So I think we have some people inside here. So I think we can go ahead and start. Uh, so thank you everyone for, for joining this room and thank you for joining the SME um, breakout room. So now uh, we'll be starting um, to hear from all our runner-ups um, on the initiatives and what they have done. You will also have a chance to ask questions later. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Shen. Uh, I am from Meet Women. I'm wearing a mask. I'm sorry because I'm outside. So you won't see my face today. Um, and yeah, so right now, We'll start um, the award speeches. Um, congratulations to our first and second runner-ups, uh, Pentago, and as well as Booty and Bussy. Very innovative um, applications this year. And they will now be sharing the speech and their work with us. First, I would now like to invite the... Oh, sorry. My screen just crashed. I would now like to invite um, Wendy uh, from Pentago. Um, to share a few words. Wendy, over to you. Thank you so much, Shren. It's been a real honor, actually, to, uh, to be included in this, you know, group of uh, amazing women. I'm so, you know, amazed at what's been, uh, you know, shared the last hour and a half. And uh, being as SME, you know, we're just really small fries here. <laughs> and, um, and it's been a long journey for me. It's like... Um, Pentacle, we are actually a landscape architectural and architectural practice that started in 1990. So, you know, it started with five of us, you know, five to go. That's where Pentacle came from. And, you know, we've built up, you know, over the years, you know, we've got up to 150 people um, doing works, you know, all over Middle East and Malaysia, India, Vietnam, and, and, and it's been very challenging. And the whole initiative, you know, as far as um, with women is from my own personal journey. You know, I'm, I'm a mother of three and, you know, I love being in construction site. I love my job and it's finding ways to balance that. And, um, and what we've done over the years is to try and, and, you know, get women more and more involved in it and, and not just designing in the office, but out there in the sites constructing and seeing what they have designed being built. And to do that, we realized that we need to balance, you know, all, all their family, their children, being wives, being mothers, being career women, and small steps, baby steps along the way. Um, you know, we've started Penta Care, including all children coming to the office if they have, you know, um, problems with um, looking after families with you know and we've started um, over the years also what I call it breakfast with Wendy and we realized that to get women out there we need to upskill them with confidence um, on the construction sites because as we know it's all male dominated 30 years ago you know when you put on a hard hat and a and a steel toe boots you are virtually outnumbered so we wanted to give confidence. So we have this talk every two weeks with you know young graduates that come through, and I spend time with them, you know, talking to them, sharing experience, um, taking them through the journey of uh, being out there with men, and getting all the experience they need on the construction steps and baby steps along the way, and it's been really rewarding because of my girls. Um, over the three, four, five years, you know, they are now, you know, having their voice heard, they are confident, and we know that women, you know, construction starts don't stop when you have babies, okay, uh, it still goes on, and we, we look at individual uh, challenges uh, with all my, my, my girls in the office to, uh, to make it work for them. So we don't have big policies and all that, like big corporation. We are very small SME and we tailor made and we have conversations with our women in the office to see what their needs are. And we work from there. Everyone is different. Everyone's challenges are different. So, um, and 
and we will learn from that over the years. Okay, so all our three directors there are men, and uh, in our four when we first started, now you know we've got three women directors in the company now, and and all of us now are basically mentoring the young uh, girls coming through. You know, I've been in construction for the last thirty-two years. So I, I really know, you know, what is involved and trying to share that, um, you know, with uh, the women, especially in Malaysia, uh, which is so um, difficult uh, for them. Um, and, and without, as I said, uh, the support of the Pentagon family, uh, which we built through, you know, basically creating family values in, in the office where we believe that equality to me, as I said, is not given it's being respected and and everyone is treated equally and kindly and and you have to earn your own respect and that's what we're trying to do all the time um, through the process and the most important thing to us is communication okay we always want to have everyone's voices heard equally um, and i think over the last 30 over years it worked for us and, uh, and, and that's why we want to progress and, and do more of that. And I really want to thank, as I said, um, you know, everyone in Pentagon family who's been, you know, working through, not, not through policies and all that, but through a teamwork, through respect and supporting one another. And, you know, my business partners, Greg has uh, been supporting this course the last 30 years. And without him, you know, we won't be uh, there today as well because, you know, I'm always pushing for, for women to be on construction sites. Thank you for recognizing our efforts. Terrific. Thank you so much, Wendy. That was really inspiring. Um, and I think the judges were also really impressed um, by, uh, sorry, by Pentago's application. So congratulations once again. Um, and now I would like to invite a um, very special guest, uh, the first runner of the SME category, um, Bruti and Bursi. Uh, we have Siti Fazlo Khalik and also Lukman Awaludin, who are the founders to share the initiative. Over to you. Hello, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Lukman Awaludin, and this is Siti Fazlo Khalik. For some weird reason, uh, his uh, her, her image is always uh, disappearing for, for this event. So we don't know why. Uh, we just take it as a good job. Uh, maybe there's something happening in the in the webcam or something like that. Okay, uh, we are from Bruti and Bersi and we are a very small social enterprise based in Kota Kinabalu, Sabah. Uh, by small, by the definition of small is we are just uh less than 10 uh 10 uh, 10 percent teams and uh we used to be uh two women and now we just uh, get another two another uh, artisan uh woman artisan in our team just uh, yesterday actually okay so uh what we are doing is uh, the the we are among the first company in here in Malaysia that introduced uh menstrual leave and uh, it's actually because of our it's because of uh, my partner Siti Fazal Khalik aka uh, my wife aka my big boss so <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, she have a oh, why don't you uh, tell the, the the story a few months ago I was diagnosed with a uh, fibroid so I I underwent a surgery um, I think I was it was last raya so from that experience, uh, I, um, Lukman uh, and I, we had a, a bigger, how do I say, understanding on uh, on menstrual leave. The I mean the actually the it's it's the, a, yeah. yeah it's a very long discussion uh, in the hospital bed because uh, when you are awarded you have. Uh, so many times and you have so little things to do so uh, it, it becomes a elaborated uh, discussion so and then after that uh, one of our uh, female employee is asking us for uh, um, how to get an mc for uh, uh, menstrual uh, uh, pen and then uh, while we are at the hospital at the time uh, we are thinking with ourselves this is so contradict with the 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 leaf itself so if she have to get an mc uh she might as well just go to the to the to the uh, workplace because 
getting to hospital or clinics to get the, the, the MC is actually same or equivalent uh, hard as going to the workplace. So uh, we do a little re research on uh, which countries that are using uh, this practice uh, and we uh, we do a little research with with uh, companies that are using this practice, uh, not here, uh, not just here in Malaysia, but uh, outside of Malaysia. And after I think uh, one month of elaborated discussion uh, with my boss, aka my uh, partner, aka my wife, uh, so uh, and then we we decide uh, just uh, to implement the uh, the the menstrual leave in our company policy. I think uh, that's all from us. Thank you very much for the uh, such a very good recognition. And we 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 are ex actually excited, and we are uh, we have an, uh, we have a, a lot of new input that we might be implementing soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Lukwan and Siti. Um, you know, as I mentioned also just now, the judges um, were really, really impressed by all SME applications, but this is the first time that we've ever seen period leave. Uh, so this is something that was really innovative and we were so interested. So congratulations, you guys deserved it. Uh, okay, so now I will open the floor for Q&A. Um, but before that, I actually have some questions uh, for some of our attendees. I don't know if some of you might have it, but let me start on my end first. Um, so my question is actually, the first question is for um, Alicia from Thrive Well, our winner. Um, Alicia, so uh, Thrive Well does a lot of work around women's mental health, right? Um, do you think that there is like a very significant difference between women's mental health and men's mental health in terms of, you know, like needs and things like that? Thanks, Trent. That's a good question. Um, what I observe, I mean, through our work, right? Um, maybe I will share a bit. If seventy percent of our beneficiaries and clients are actually women. Um, I think naturally because women have better health-seeking behavior, meaning you know if they notice something's wrong with them, they're more open to reach out for help. While you know, men of course may have a particular for mental health. You know, it there's still a big stigma. So I think that is encouraging that you know, um, um, women access the services more. But what we see is actually the barriers to accessing the services, and that's what we focus on. Not so much about treatment is there. You know, hospital, private or public hospitals, or you know, in different settings. But these social barriers, for example, like um, in the workplace. So how do they inform, um, example, um, I see a client on weekday, right? And they're like, oh, I have to take leave. How do I tell my boss that I'm taking leave? It's only for one hour. I'm just taking half a day leave. How do I, you know? I mean, technically they don't have to tell, but sometimes they're like, oh, you know. So so the bear, the stigma of, of telling other people that I need the services. Um, and I mentioned in, in the speech as well, those, those responsibilities that a woman, you know, a woman, especially with family, holds, right? Um, take, children, um, you know, uh, caregiving, um, and the expectation that they need to manage everything. I think that um, perpetuates, so it's not a cause of the mental health, but I see significantly it does have an impact on them. Like, for example, they may not be able to come for the treatment on a regular basis, or they, you know, or, or, or it, it's the, the responsibilities, it's like, it's like opportunity costs, I would say. So if, if, if they don't get the support from there, then they won't be able to access the services. So that's why it's very important. And compared to men, I think men is more the stigma, the social, cultural stigma of I'm a man. And, you know, uh, maybe I don't know, Lokman, <laughs> maybe can, uh, you know, share. But usually if they want to go, they just go. Yeah, I know this, like, uh, you know, and, and they don't have to tell anyone. But I think for women, the need um, of connection is stronger. Um, and yeah, so I guess that's, that's how I see the difference. Like very often, um, if I'm working, you know, in terms of focusing on treatment of the symptoms, I have to work on what are all these barriers around them before I can actually go to that. You know, okay, let, let's work on you know how to reduce the symptom. Is the social functioning or social or lack of social support that's that um, a major part of our work, lah? And and in general, you know, you see that seventy to eighty percent of of a lot of mental issues and challenges come from the environment. Yeah, not ourselves, you know, ourselves at 20-30% biologically and all that, mm -hmm. but 
it's actually the eighty percent that maybe will trigger or keep you know um 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 trick. I mean, in a way, maintaining it lah. Yeah, once again, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Elisha. Um, so I do have a question. I guess a more general question. Uh, for for Wendy and also Lukman. So the question from from my end is, you know, in implementing all this, I think the main kickback or setback for a lot of us is when we want to implement something in a company that maybe has quite a few people, not everyone will agree, right? So getting buy-in from your employees um, because you're both leading uh, your companies, you know, like how did you manage to convince people, you know, that this is the way that you think is right, that is inclusive for everyone? Because some people might have a pushback, like, oh, why are you championing this? It doesn't make sense that you only support women. And then for Brute and Bersi, uh, mungkin ada macam the male employees, they're tak puas hati, sebab, ah, yeah, women, they get like one extra day leave. Why? So maybe we can start with Wendy first. Um, we do have a bit of time left, so maybe we can keep it to about two minutes per person. So Wendy, you can go first. I think, yeah, you're very right, Liz pointed out. Um, it's you know, equality is not just for women. It's, you know, everyone is treated equally in, in the office, uh, in our workplace, especially with Pentagon. But what it is, is we are making it possible for women and the opportunities are there for women to take up the challenges that only, you know, our sort of male sort of um, uh, employees could do because of the circumstances. It's not so much of their ability. A lot of women do not take up the challenges on, you know, our projects because it involves traveling, involves long hours in the construction site, you know, hot bothered, you know. Um, and, and those were, you know, it's not all about abilities. It's about, you know, so, you know them being able to balance their family, their children, and all that. So when when that is all spelled out, um, you know, that, you know, that is not favoring one over the other. It's not, you know, uh, sort of prejudice, um, you know, uh, at all. Uh, it's very well accepted, okay? And we get and, and involve all the men in the offices to basically share the experience and, and train our girls, especially the young ones, Okay, taking them to, to construction sites, seeing things being built there, we include them in the process. Yeah, so it's, it's not about company making certain decisions and then you have to follow it. It's trying to make sure that everyone understand what we're trying to achieve and including them in the process. Um, that's why I said to Pentagon, we, we build it as uh, I said, from family values, okay? Um, and I always say, if you men, you know, you've got daughters and sons, you know, you want to give them, you know, equal sort of uh, opportunities. And, and the, the, the first step is always the hardest, okay? It's like for women, if you've never been on a construction site and you've never been given a chance to be on a construction site, because, you know, you need to have, you need to upskill, you need to, to be able to go through the safety courses, you need to go through all this, you know, basic uh, uh, skill um, before you get there. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's getting that process uh, ingrained um, and things like this don't happen overnight. It's, uh, it's having that mentorship, having that opportunities open, finding the right uh, projects, the finding the right opportunities uh, and, and, you know, avenues uh, to, to kickstart that. You know, I think that that's what the challenges over the last 30 years. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Let me just check with my colleague. Uh, okay, Lukman, I think we have like one minute. One minute to go. Okay. So for us, it's all about communication and to be specific, it's all about conversation. So uh, we are very uh, happy. Okay. Uh, we are glad that uh, we instill the, uh, what, 54 seconds. Okay. <laughs> we instill the empathy from the beginning of our uh, the journey. So uh, most of our employees, our artisan is actually raised by a single mother. So they, they do have the hurts in the right, the hearts in the right place at the, at, at the beginning. So it's easy for us. All right. I think that's all from us. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Tukman, and thank you everyone for joining this SME uh, room. It was really, really amazing. We were so amazed, honestly, with the qualities this year. Um, like I said, you know, some of the even felt that you were even ahead 
of some of the bigger corporations. So good job. And we really, really look forward um, to seeing your progress. Don't forget to become a web signatory. Um, and thank you so much for contributing to gender equality in Malaysia. See you guys back in the main room. Welcome back, everyone. Um, apologies if I've had to cut uh, conversations short. Uh, we, I, I, I know that conversations like this and asking um, our awardees questions will easily take up a few more hours. <laughs> so I know this won't be the last time you'll get to speak to them. Uh, we do want to continue with this conversation and, and partnerships with all our uh, web signatories, awardees as well. So. Uh, this is not the last time we'll be talking about leadership commitment, about women's economic empowerment, or your wider DEI, sort of strategy and policies. Um, next year, we'll have a few more lined up uh, activities coming up where you will have this opportunity to connect and learn from each other. And we, what we want is to uh, for organizations to continue motivate and encourage each other, right, so that we collectively move the needle and that's how we actually can make uh, a really sort of substantial and sustainable impact so using a lot of big words here uh, now that everyone is back i would like to at this point congratulate all our awardees um, for our 2022 wax awards malaysia uh, ceremony uh, so here this is our wall of awardees congratulations all and thank you so much for submitting in your applications, for making your time for our ceremony today, and for you know engaging in the conversations in the breakout rooms. Now, um, for all our awardees and judges, if you could stay on a few more uh, minutes, we'll we'll take one last group photo. But at this point, I've it's been such an honor to host everybody today. Uh, I know a lot of us have a hard stop at 12, so I'm just going to wrap up and thank our guest speakers, Ms. Sarah Nibs, Mr. Timo, and also Ms. Karima for their well wishes through their videos today. Our esteemed judges for your time over the past few months to review and score the applications. And of course, to all our attendees for making your time here today to celebrate all our Malaysian-based organizations and, and hope we can continue to cheer them on, especially in the regional ceremony that is happening on the 19th of November, which also coincides with our voting day. Um, so yes, I hope everybody can spare some time as well to send our awardees, um, uh, winners, sorry, uh, the encouragement that they need. So hopefully we can recognize a few more Malaysian organizations at the regional level. So at this point, I would like to thank UN Women for giving us again the opportunity to host the Malaysian ceremony. And obviously to our lead women team, to Shren, who's been running this in the back end and really driving and ensuring that the event goes smoothly. And to Fatin, Atika, Trisha, uh, Archana, and of course, and Ceiling uh, for all their support in the back end, ensuring that today runs as smoothly as possible. And also to our awardees for you know keeping to the time and our judges as well. So at this point, I would like to say thank you again, everybody. I'll let you go off for your day. Um, our awardees and judges, please stay on. But to everybody else, continue to stay safe, stay safe, take care, and we hope that you exercise your right to vote uh, in our next upcoming general election. Um, so yes, uh, that's our PSA here today. So thank you all so much again. We hope to see you at our next Web Awards ceremony next year, if not in between during any of our events um, and sessions from Lead Women. Thank you all. Take care. <laughs>